table list. Veteran Tim Hewlett, who uh, used to play for the White Sox, has been recalled. He'll be in the lineup tonight at third base. Rene Gonzalez will play second base. How will Bill Ripken's injury affect this club? I think Billy, uh, for one, is, is probably the spirit of this ball club. You know, he's a character on the team. But not only that, he does an outstanding job in the field. And he's also the kind of kind of flair that you'd like to have in a dark alley with you. But I don't think they've hurt themselves at all knowing full well that they can go down once again into their minor league system and get a proven veteran ball player like Tim Hewlett to play for them and then move uh, Gonzalez to second base. Defensively, I don't think they've lost anything at all, even though uh, Billy's a tremendous player and, and probably is deserving of the gold glove for that position. But knowing full well that you have the, uh, the, uh, the other players to fill those spots, big boost. All right, let's take a look at the starting lineups for tonight's game. For the Milwaukee Brewers, Paul Molitor is the designated hitter. He'll lead off. Ed Romero, who was just acquired from the Braves to replace the injured Bill Bates at second base. They waste no time getting him in the lineup. B.J. Suroff will play third base. Robin Yount is in center field. Greg Brock at first base for the Brewers. Charlie O'Brien will do the catching. Rookie Greg Vaughn is in left field. Mike Felder in right field batting eighth and Gus Pollitter will play shortstop and hit ninth and pitching for the Brewers tonight is veteran right hander Tom Filer. Well uh, Tommy's got an opportunity to pitch. He might never have realized that not so many arms gone down to injury this year but still he's he's, he's earned his way back after arm problems sidelined his uh, trek through a big league career and his in his 30s he's getting started again a little late but better late than ever again. You know he's kept uh, opposing hitters uh, collectively at at under 250 and, and though he doesn't record many strikeouts he doesn't walk too many either he's got pretty good command and the Brewers need another good game from Tom Filer tonight and for the Orioles tonight Bill Bradley will lead off and play left field he has four hits in the series so far Stan Jefferson is the center fielder Cal Ripken at shortstop Joe Orsalak is in right field Randy Milligan at first base Larry Sheets is a designated hitter tonight Bob Melvin will do the catching. Rene Gonzalez at second base. And Tim Hewlett makes his first start for the Orioles at third base. And pitching on three days rest is right-hander Bob Malecki, the big bird. Well, he's thrown with a blizzard of confidence uh, this season, even though he suffered through a, a subpar season record-wise. But his efforts often Mel have been steadfastly <clears throat> superior to his opponents, yet a lack of run support or relief assistance has gone lacking in many instances. But still, you know, that hasn't bothered bothered in his this big guy's preparation uh, or headlong approach to the next game down the road and you know that's a good way to move through a long season plus he's given every indication he likes to shift to a four man rate to rotation so he hopes to push out, uh, out uh, another victory here this evening. Well we're in the midst of a heated pennant race the Toronto Blue Jays are two games back of the Orioles Milwaukee is two and a half games out and Bob Malacki right in the middle of it and Tom Davis asked him before the game do you like pitching in a pennant race versus pitching earlier in the season. Uh, of course because there's a little more intensity involved. Uh, every pitch counts. I mean make one bad pitch could be the whole game. How about the rotation now? You're on three days rest. Does that help or hinder you? I think it helps me because I stay in my rhythm longer. I mean it just seems like when I have that extra day the fourth you know day day rest it's just like sometimes I can get out of a little bit of rhythm take me a little bit to get started but now I've been since three days rest I'm getting that you know staying in the rhythm talking a little bit with Pete Harness he says that sometimes the catcher helps him you know more or less like framing pitches and getting uh, position on pitches do you feel the same way about yourself yeah I think uh, the catcher does a lot you know for the pitchers I mean if you're just missing outside and you frame a pitch it's good I mean plus they, they they do most of the thinking in the game anyway so you don't see me shaking off too much <laughs> Tonight's starting pitcher Bob Malacki and the umpires for tonight's game Rich Garcia is behind the plate Mike Riley at first base Rocky Rowe at second and Dale Scott at third. If the Orioles should sweep the Brewers tonight it would be their first sweep against Milwaukee since they took four of the Brewers here in June of 1985. A warm, humid night here at the stadium. Temperatures in the 80s. The humidity is 52%. I want to wish a happy birthday, well, John, to Brewers. Michelle Robinson, Come the lovely daughter of Oriole manager Frank Robinson. Number She's eight. celebrating a birthday. Uh, I believe it's actually tomorrow, but since the team is 
going to be out of town. Uh, they're celebrating a little early, early, and she was nice enough to drop off a piece of cake to us. Boy, is that cake good? Just while you try it. Defensively, Randy Milligan is at first base. Renee Gonzalez at second. Cal Ripken at shortstop. And Tim Hewlett, who just joined the club today from Rochester, makes his first start. Bill Bradley, who's had an outstanding series, is in left field. Stan Jefferson is the center fielder. And Joe Orsalak is in right field. Bob Melvin will do the catching tonight. And rookie right-hander Bob Malacki makes his 27th start. That's tops among Major League rookies. You heard him say it, Mel. I notice an air of excitement in the move to a four-man uh, starting rotation, not only from Bob, but from the other members of the frontline staff. And that change alone might have been the pump they've needed to uh, energize what remains of this season. And Bob's a bulldog anyway, and he's always ignored the distractions in here in this uh, long, demanding campaign in which he's likely to generate some 34-plus starts on the year. Well, the four-man rotation seems to be agreeing with the Orioles since going to it. They are four and one with three complete games and two shutouts. Duffy Dyer is coaching at third base. And Andy Echeverin at first. And we're ready to go with the third and final game in this series. Milwaukee leading the season series five to four. But the Orioles have won the first two in the series in Memorial Stadium. Paul Molitor hitting 288, leading off for the Brewers, and he takes a pitch low and away. Molitor is DHing. He's had some hamstring problems again this year. Called strike. Last night, the Brewers lost two starters during the course of the game. Shortstop Bill Spires injured his shoulder, and Bill Bates tripped at first base. He separated his shoulder. He's been placed on the disabled list. Spires is day to day. But this club continues to be plagued by injuries. They had nine players on the disabled list before last night's game. Two balls and one strike to Molitor. Who has gone two for seven in the series so far. Ed Romero is on deck. Strike a fastball on the outside corner. You, know, you keep Molitor in check, and you've got a pretty good chance of uh, coming out on the long end of an evening like this. Now, that ball was about a half a foot outside there, so if he's going to get those kinds of calls, then maybe he should stay out there. I mean, Tom Treblehorn, you know, he's calling balls and strikes from the dugout, and if you can see it from in there, then you know you expect the umpire to be able to discern between a ball and a strike. Stuck him on. The big key to beating this team is to keep Molitor off the bases, and the Orioles have done a good job of that during the series. See, this has not begun in a good fashion tonight's game. And he, and he stuck, you know, he stuck out there and he stuck down in the strike zone, and Molly had to go after it because he had to protect the plate. You know, this is that bulldog tenacity we're talking about. Malaki seeking out any kind of edge he can possibly seek out. The Brewers lead the league in stolen bases, and in the first seven games against the Orioles, they swiped 14 and 15 attempts, but they've had none in this series. The Orioles have really shut down their running game. Strike one to Ed Romero, who's back for his second tour of duty with the club. He spent most of his career with Milwaukee. Most recently with Boston, they released him. The Braves picked him up, and he was acquired by the Brewers from Atlanta. Crowded to third. Tim Hillman is up with it, and he makes the play. You know, for the most part, Mel, you're allowed a couple extra men in the infield. So they used up their allotment last night. And now the Orioles used one of theirs, their regular players, and now they've got Timmy Hewlett. PJ. Veteran player who played for the White Sox. And you know he's in a position where he can really help this ball club with uh, some of his uh, usually strong play. Craig Worthington also has a tender shoulder, so Hewlett is giving him a night off. B.J. Surhoff steps in with two outs and nobody on. He went 0 for 4 last night. Fastball low from Bob Malaki. Malaki's last start came Saturday. He lost to Toronto 5 to 1. A typical hard luck loss for Malaki, who pitched very well. Waving at a changeup. 
and it's one and one in that loss he went seven and two thirds innings and gave up only three hits and for the third straight start he didn't allow a hit until the fifth inning. Foul one and two to Sir Hall. Well, that's the kind of assistance that, that Malaki's been missing for the most part this year, Mel, as, as we mentioned. You know, his, his record could easily be reversed. Robin Yout is on deck for the Brewers, who need a win. They've fallen two and a half games off the pace. They had won nine out of ten entering this series. Came in a half game out with a chance to move into first place, but couldn't do it. Hit it to left center field for a base hit. Oh, a two out single by B.J. Surhan. Batting fourth, the center fielder, number 19. They've got Surhan hitting Robin. in the right position in that lineup. Yeah. And when you hit Yount fourth, and then if, if Mollerter gets on like he's capable of getting on, you've got some early people who can really swing the bat well. Oh, with two down a runner at first, Robert Yount comes up for the first time. I was visiting with hitting instructor Tony Muser, and he said he feels this is Yount's best season since 1982 when he was the American League's most valuable player. Strike one. I was asking Tom Treblehorn about the difference or the similarities between Paul Molitor and Robin Yount, both great players, and had an interesting answer. He said, Yacht is an instinctive player. Molitor is an intuitive player. He said, Molitor thinks things out. He's several steps ahead of everyone else with his thought process. He said, Robin just naturally knows how to react. He says, they get to the same destination, but they do it differently. I'll be honest with you. It takes a school teacher to be able to figure something like that out. <laughs> sure sounds good, though, doesn't it? <laughs> with the results no, they both had right. outstanding careers See, Surhoff there. runs very well he has 14 stolen bases and 17 attempts popped up off first base Randy Milligan over near the stands and he's got it nice play well, it looked like that ball was going to drift into the stands because the wind is blowing lazily from left to right field here but, uh, you know, he stuck with it and was able to snatch it before someone in the stands could snatch it from him. Mentioned that both Bill Ripken and Craig Worthington were shaken up last night. Let's take a look at Worthington injury and see how he got hurt. It was a night for injuries as the Brewers lost two starters. And the Orioles had two people injured. He makes a great play on this ball, a diving stop. But came down hard. Like he might have hyperextended his, his elbow just to, or his shoulder just a little bit. I don't know what the deal is. There's been a lot of emphasis on shoulder injuries this year. You know, when you're a very active player and you're diving and jumping and, and doing the splits and everything in the outfield and landing on your shoulders and your elbows, you're going to suffer more of those injuries. Yeah, the Red Sox have lost Wade Boggs for a few days. Mm -hmm. See, they can't afford to lose, to lose anyone, really. Greg Brock is at first base tonight for the Brewers. Ed Romero takes over at second base with Bill Bates going on the disabled list. Gus Pauliter, who had platooned at second with Bates, is the shortstop. Bill Spires got hurt last night. B.J. Suroff at third base. Rookie Greg Vaughn, a big power hitter, was recently recalled from Denver. The American Association is in left field. Robin Yount is the center fielder. And things got so bad last night that Mike Felder had to come in from right field to play second base, and he handled himself well, but he's back in right tonight. Charlie O'Brien is behind the plate for the Brewers. Right-hander Tom Filer makes his seven starts as being recalled from the Denver Zenus of the American Association. Well, so he, Denver Zephyrs, beg your pardon. That's not well, you should know what they are in that area. Anyway. That's the zenith of their season, but they're still losing. <laughs> Tom's no spring chicken at, at 32 years of age. I think 33 in December, but he's given all the signs of one who's ready to make a go of it 
finally late in his professional career. You know, if anyone has spent his fair share of time at the minor league level, it's been Tom. He had a brief uh, shining stint with Toronto in 85, only to succumb eventually to elbow surgery in 86. So it's been a long road back. And you know, this is his seventh start since his recall, and he's pitched with a blaze of light at 4-1 and one and scoring an under-3 ERA. Cal Ripken Sr. and Johnny Oates, the third and first base coaches, respectively, for the Orioles. You know, if they hadn't changed the name from the Denver Bears to the Zephyrs, but I wouldn't have that difficulty. I when I was growing up in Denver, they were the Bears. Well, when I played against them, they were the Bears. Apparently, they wanted to get away from the minor league image, and so they renamed the team. Yeah, Zephyrs, Zephyrs. doesn't sound minor league. Strike one to Phil Bradley, who's had an outstanding series. He's four for six through the first two games, and has raised his average to 284. Bill went through a little slump, but he's hitting the ball well again. One ball, one strike. You know, it's almost like that Bradley has refocused his attention on the on the remainder of the second half of this season when he was shifted into that number that number one spot. He was swinging the bat so so sluggishly, but now he's come around well. One ball, two strikes to Phil, who's been a much better hitter when he's hitting out of that leadoff spot. He had a great series against the Brewers in Milwaukee, went 10 for 13, including a 5 for 5 performance. Bouncer up the middle, and that's through for a base hit, and he's at it again. That's his fifth hit of the series. Phil, uh, uh, coming to the plate for the first time, was hitting 6.09 against Milwaukee. So he is now 15 for 24 in the season. See, this is his team. This is the team he does exceptionally well against. This used to be your team. You used to hit this pitching staff well in Milwaukee. I did because it seemed to me that they all threw the same, just alike. And, and if I hit one guy, I could hit them all. Dan Jeffers who tries to punt his way on, but pokes it foul. But I think that's true, Mel, of just about every player that plays the game. There's going to be one, maybe two teams that, that he does real well against. Frank and Robinson's Orioles have opened up a two-game lead over Toronto and a two-and-a-half game bulge over Milwaukee. Fastball is low, one ball, one strike. Jefferson last night was 0 for 4, but he did contribute with two stolen bases, a run scored, and an RBI. Facing a high fastball, 1 and 2. I'll tell you, Mel, the, the, the entire Orioles club seemed to have, have kind of recaptured that magic and that, and that energy of the first half. And if that's the case, and this notion kind of spearheaded by recent successes on the mound, and at the plate and in the field it has really come into focus just in time for the remainder of the five week uh, surge here. Bill Bradley draws the throw. Phil has 14 stolen bases. He's only been caught three times. The Orioles have beat the Brewers at their own game in this series. The running game. There goes Bradley. Swing and a miss by Jefferson. O'Brien's throw is in time. Charlie O'Brien has a very strong arm. His manager, Tom Treblehorn, feels it's the equal of any throwing arm in the American League. Now, you can't take Tom Filer for granted. It's because he hasn't been pitching that long this year, but he's 4-1 with an under-3 ERA, and he knows how to pitch. And uh, you got a catcher that can get the ball down there quite quickly. You can see Bradley come up a little short there. But, you know, wasn't much he could do. Try to play a little game, try to get to the back because the throw just beat him. That's that trick that Marty Barrett pulled on Bill Ripken a couple of years ago where he knew he was going to be out, so he slid short of the bag. Billy came down with a swipe tag and missed him, and then he stuck his foot in there and was safe. Now Jefferson strikes out. Bradley is thrown out. And there are two down as Cal Ripken steps in. Strike one. Cal had a three-run homer in the first game of the series, won by the Orioles 5 to nothing. The more you see of Phil Bradley, the more you appreciate him made several outstanding plays in this series. One thing he does very well is take out second baseman and shortstops, double play situations. And he's hitting the ball extremely well, especially against Milwaukee. One ball, two strikes. Two 
two and two. Joe Orsalak is on deck. Off the plate, and he goes to a full count with Cal Ripken. Cal leads the club and runs batted in with 76. Seen Filer's strength already. It's a fastball slider combination. You know, those can be two devastating pitches if the pitcher's on. Struck him off. Well, Filer strikes out Stan Jefferson and Cal Ripken to end the inning. And at the end of one, the Orioles, the Brewers are scoreless. The all-new 1990 Subaru Legacy has more impressive standard features than the Camry or Accord. Now, to make room for the Legacy, Subaru is clearing out its 89. With $1,000 back on 89 sedans, $1,000 back on 89 three-doors, $1,000 back on wagons, $3,000 back on XT, $1,000 back on Justy. With all that cash back standard, you can raise your standard of living. Raise your standard of living. See your Subaru dealer. Car? I don't have a car. What's the gas can for? Well, I'm thinking about getting one. Now, Mom, you know you can get taken advantage of with these home improvement projects. Let me just go over this estimate. Hmm, price is right. <laughs> Probably not a full central air conditioning system. No, full central air. They finance. Install right away. Yeah, but what brand? Kenmore. Mom, this is Sears. We've trusted the Kenmore name for years. If you just said Sears on the phone, I wouldn't have had to rush over here. A visit is always nice. <laughs> All Giants offer checkout coupons. Coupons based on what you purchase, so there's a greater chance you'll get a coupon you can really use. Checkout coupons, another way to save at Giants. One of the Milwaukee Brewers, got a fifth and a first baseman. Headed to the series, the 89 Orioles. I'm Ellen John. Thank you. We hope so. Miss Dayton Allen once said, John. Yes. Why not? <laughs> Remember him on the old Steve? Sure, Allen show? of course. That's uh, apparently becoming a somewhat of a slogan around here. Why not? Will the Orioles win it? Why not? Of course, uh, Bet Midler said one of her uh, mm -hmm. acts, the Detroit Tigers slogan would be, why bother? <laughs> Two balls and no strikes to Greg Brock. He had to be there, John. Yeah, I guess so. Brock will be followed by Charlie O'Brien and then Greg Vaughn. There it is. Why not? Like that. Stop and think about the reasons why they shouldn't win it. Why not? Call strike. Three and one. Charlie O'Brien is on deck. Bob Malacki walks the leadoff batter. It's the first walk he's allowed. See, that's never too healthy in a lineup that's just looking to try to score some runs. Of course, Malacki knows that. And he, he, he usually sometimes get into the pattern of maybe trying to pitch just a little too carefully. Now to bring up the Milwaukee catcher, Charlie O'Brien, who's looking for his first hit in the series. He's 0 for 5. By the way, Ben McDonald makes his professional debut right. tonight in Frederick. We understand there's a, a sellout crowd, large media turnout. We hope to have some footage of his effort later tonight. Understand they're going to limit him to 55 pitches. Well, that's not going to satisfy 10,000 people. 
an overflow crowd in Frederick. Mm -hmm. The runner is gone, and they get the bunt down. Malaki will have only one play to first base. So Brock running on the pitch. They make sure they get him to second base. I like that play when you, when you don't have a very swift runner on base and you put him in motion and hope the pitcher throws a strike and then the hitter can get the ball down. You don't even have to make a good bunt. You know, that's not a great bunt right there, but it does the job because Brock's running on the play. Well, the Brewers have a runner in scoring position for the first time tonight. And Bob Malacky will face rookie Greg Vaughn, who was just recalled from Denver, where he was leading the American Association in home runs. In 110 games, he'd hit 26 and driven in 92 runs. He'd also stolen 20 bases. And he's hit well since joining the big club, 370. Strike call. Vaughn has been a prolific home run hitter in the Brewers system, and uh, Tony Musa, the hitting instructor, mm -hmm. was saying that when these guys come up, guys like Vaughn, who hit for power in the minor leagues, he doesn't stress that they try to hit home runs, but they hit the ball hard because a lot of them have played in places like El Paso in the Texas League, Denver in the American Association, where the ball really carries. And he said some of them come up here thinking that they're home run hitters in the big leagues. Based on that, the balls that went out at Denver or El Paso wind up being caught on the warning track, and he said it can get awfully frustrating. So because of that, he just tells them, hit the ball hard somewhere. I like that philosophy, and of course, it's going to pay big dividends along the along the way here as you familiarize yourself with opposing pitchers. See, that's what uh, someone else, uh, that's what uh, a young hitter also goes through. Not only do you try to maintain that same, same offensive approach, but you got to familiarize yourself with the opposition. That's hit high and foul down the left field line. So you can see right there, he's got tremendous bat speed. Somebody made a great catch. They hit 28 home runs last year at El Paso and 26 this year at Denver, but they figure in the big leagues he's going to be about a 20 to 25 home run man per year. He's not going to be a guy who's going to hit 40. But he'll get you 20 to 25. Yeah, even 20 to 25, that's a lot of home runs. That's a very large projection. Well, that's going to help because the Brew Crew's run scoring attack is going to have to improve. Two balls, two strikes, throw to second, but Brock is back safely. Getting a big lead, and Bob yeah. Melvin tried to pick him off. See, if you're a slow runner, then you have to be a little more aggressive on the base pass. You, you have to have to kind of lengthen out your lead out there at second base to make sure you can score on a ball that's hit pretty well in the outfield. Oriole pitchers have done an excellent job holding base runners in this series. Quickly first base, throwing over and holding the ball and throwing off their timing. And they've kept the running game in check. Ground ball to third. Hewlett checks the runner and throws to first. A big stretch by Milligan gets the job done. See, now the Brewers have been somewhat proficient in scoring runs lately, but, you know, they're going to continue to need, as manager Tom, uh, Tom Treblehorn says, you know, that, that timely batting reply, and that could vastly disinflate the pressure on the starting staff to contain the opposition. You know, as both of these ball clubs improve their defenses also, that helps this pitcher as well. I like Hewlett down at that position. Fields that spot well, and he's a he's a pretty good hitter. He can play all of the middle infield positions and is experienced. Mike Felder playing right field tonight. He went one for three and drove in a run last night. He hit a long double to right center field that almost got out of here. Hewlett playing up on the grass at third. Felder will bunt for a base hit, and he's very fast. Ball one. You, you've got to be able to cut a guy like Felder into the starting lineup somewhere. Because he can be an advantage for this ball club. Switch hitter. Can fly, as you mentioned, Mel. Highly successful stolen base artist. And he's a line drive hitter with some pop. We saw that uh, last night. Called strike, one and one. 
No runs, one hit for Milwaukee. No runs, one hit for the Orioles. Felder, who was the Brewers' third round pick in January of 1981. Last year, he was bothered by hamstring problems all year long. When his legs are healthy, he can really run. Two and one. He's got to keep his average up now. Because if you keep your average up, then you get on base, you score some runs, steal bases, and that's his primary job. Two years ago, when he was healthy for Milwaukee, he hit 266 and stole 34 bases, 34 and 42 attempts, which is outstanding. So you can imagine if it's like 285, how many bases he can steal. Strike on the outside corner, and it's two and two. Well, Richie Garcia behind the plate is, is really having a difficult time here through one inning and into the second. You know, the, the plate is just bouncing all over the place. And it's very, very wide. But I think all four of them were in a the car last night after the game. They were heading down to Little Italy. So, you know, he might have got a little messed up down there. <laughs> Too much pasta. Trying to check his swing on a breaking ball, and it's inside. It's three and two. He almost pulled the trigger. No score, top of the second inning. The Brewers really need to win. They'll be off tomorrow and then go to Toronto to begin a four-game series. Struck him out. Well, Bob Malaki strikes out Mike Felder with a runner in scoring position. At the end of an inning and a half, the Orioles and the Brewers are scoreless. Let's go to that. A man of many talents, Tom Davis. Tom? Well, I feel like it's time to let's make a deal right here in the booth behind you. The 7-Eleven uh, Kodak Fly with the Orioles contest has ended, folks. And I'm in the back of the booth right behind John and Mel here. I've got Larry Faskowitz from uh, Kodak and also Walter Mance from 7-Eleven. Welcome. You can see this one's from Kodak and this one's from 7-Eleven here. As you can see the, uh, the details. How about spinning the, uh, the wheel here and let's... Uh, Get a good spin to try to find out who's going to win this trip to Chicago. It's a trip for the Labor Day weekend to Chicago to watch the Orioles take on the White Sox at Comiskey Park in Chicago. And, uh, gentlemen, let's uh, make the pick and uh, tell us a little bit about how the contest was created to begin with. Well, the contest was uh, a combination of the great HTS home team sports, Kodak, and 7-Eleven stores, trying to bring together the number one team, the Orioles, uh, and the number one fans, which are, of course, the uh, Oriole fans, and get them to go to a trip to uh, Chicago for a uh, home game with an all-expense-paid trip. Of course, Kodak very big in this also with 7-Eleven. Uh, the response has been pretty good, I would presume. Oh, it's been great. All the customer had to do was just go to their local 7-Eleven, look for the Kodak film display, and voila, go up to Chicago. Talking about a display, there's one right there. Draw, let's draw them, gentlemen. Uh, to take the honor, you take the honor. Okay? Go ahead. All righty, now you're going to fight over who calls it out. One, only one, only one now. All right, here's the winner. I guess, go ahead, you said. All right, the name is a C.F. Wisner of Pasadena, Maryland. Congratulations. He'll win the trip for Chicago to see the Orioles and the White Sox over the Labor Day weekend, and we thank 7-Eleven and Kodak. It's time now to go to Mel Proctor and John Lowenstein right here below me. Thank you, <laughs> Monty Hall. <laughs> the inimitable. Tom Davis. Come on Morning down. Morning. The right fielder, number one, Joe no. Orsola. All right, we didn't win. I had our name uh, in there. We didn't win. Old C.F. Weisner, Pasadena won. All right. Joe Orsolak leads off the bottom of the second against Tom Feiler, who struck out two of the three batters he faced in the first inning. Orsolak tries to bunt it, strike one. Bill Bradley led off with a single in the first, then was thrown out trying to steal, and then Filer fanned Stan Jefferson and Cal Ripken. Orsalak was 0 for 3 last night, but drove in a run, and it's one ball, one strike to Joe. Well, it seems as though every time Orsalak is out there, he's either in the process of scoring a run or knocking a run in. And those kinds of players that you put out there just about every day are absolutely invaluable. 
He drove in the first run last night for the sacrifice fly in the first inning. Ground ball up the middle. Pogger makes the pickup and throws him out. See, if you stay in front of those balls, they bounce up and they hit you in the gut. Then you can always retrieve them, catch them, and then throw the man out. But if you feel those balls from the side, that ball would have skipped over his run and eventually into the outfield. Gus Pollard has been a good acquisition for this club. He was acquired from the Angels for catcher Bill Schroeder. All right. With all of the injuries, he's really important. He can play either second base or shortstop. His best position is shortstop, and he is more than adequate at second. Fastball for a strike to Randy Milligan. Randy has just five hits in his last 33 at bats, but he continues to draw walks. He's walked 11 times in 12 games. One ball, one strike. I don't think it's a case of him really being in a slump right now, just hitting the ball at people. He needs to be swinging the bat pretty well. Yeah, the net, that's right. You, you measure that indication by how well, how well you're hitting the ball. You know, not what, not what you're hitting average for. Two balls and two strikes. You know, if you start worrying about the ball dropping in, then you start doing things wrong at the plate. Larry Sheets is on deck. Grounded in the hole, and it's off the glove of the third baseman, Sirhan. Gus Pauliter, the shortstop, might have had a play had the third baseman, Siroff, not go with the ball. Exactly. Now, when a third baseman has to go that far and then still dive, then usually when he comes up with the ball to throw it, he's not going to get this man. You know, he conceivably could have caught the ball, but it's inconceivable that he'd have gotten up in time and thrown out a speedy Randy Milligan to first. Yeah, I think Pauliter had that play made. He didn't, wouldn't have had the backhand it either. He was coming in behind the ball and would have been able to make a strong throw. Right, he was moving into the ball to catch it in the throw. The Orioles' second hit. Here's Larry Sheets. He takes a fastball on the outside corner. Larry seemed to be swinging the bat a little better in his uh, last start before last night. He had three hits, and then last night went one for four and hit the ball hard a couple of other times. Well, it's an encouraging sight for this ball club because they need his big left-handed bat. He got jammed and hits it in the center field. That's going to drop in. You see Robin Young trying to decoy Randy Milligan, acting like he was going to catch the ball to get him to slow down and prevent him from going to third. Yeah, exactly, Mel. And that's why you've got to make sure when you're running that you know where the ball is going to land out there because if you're watching the outfielder, sometimes you're going to get peeked out, fooled, and he's going to end up catching that ball on a bounce and throwing you out. Well, John, how about this? We understand that Ben McDonald's pro debut tonight in the first inning. He got out of trouble in the first inning as his teammates turned a triple play behind him. Oh, boy. All the guys with all the money get all the breaks. <laughs> Is that amazing? It is first inning of pitching and professional ranks? That is amazing. That's Bob good to hear. Up, pick up. Thought we were going to have a pickoff attempt, and it almost cost the Brewers because Pollard, the shortstop, broke through the bag, and it was a big hole on the left side. If Melvin had been able to hit that ball, he would have had a base hit. Yeah, because Pollard was way out of position, and conversely, had he thrown the ball to second, Milligan would have been out by 10 feet. Melvin has been an excellent hitter with men in scoring position. Lines it foul. But holding McDonald down to 55 pitches, you need to throw 55 pitches in two innings. Three innings. Rene Gonzalez on deck. Well, we hope to have highlights of Ben's debut tonight. You know, ben was throwing 170 for, for LSU. Bob Melvin batting 286 with runners in scoring position. Pollard breaks to the bag, and this time Filer steps off the rubber. No score, bottom of the second inning. Thomas Carson, Filer the third. On the mound for the Brewers tonight. Fastball with the knees for a strike. One and two. You can't help but root for a guy like Filer. It took him a long time to get to the big leagues, and then we got there. He went 7 0 with Toronto. And then he came down with elbow problems. 
He first came up with the Cubs in 1982. On the field, the first Mike Riley says no swing in emphatic fashion. Yes. And it's two balls, two strikes. And usually the guy standing at first base has a much better view of it. And it's all based on intent. There's just no way the umpire behind the plate can detect the swing there. Popped up back of the plate, and that'll carry back to the seats. So he came up with the Cubs. He couldn't have lasted long there. No, he pitched in eight games for the Cubs in 1982 and didn't come back to the big leagues until 1985 with Toronto when he went 7-0. Missed all of the 86 season with arm problems. Last year with the Brewers, he was 5-8. and eight. Probably one needs a slap on the back. The way his team's gone lately in terms of injuries. Line to right. Felder makes the play. Throws to first, and they get the double play. Or did they? Yes. Well, the Orioles think they didn't get the double play, but the Brewers are leaving the field. But I can't believe Felder was right there to make this play. What great anticipation on the part of this little guy in right field. You know, that looked like a base scoring knock to me. And then he turned out to be right in that position. Well, Larry Sheets has doubled off at first. The Orioles come up empty. No runs, two hits, one left at the end of two. Still no score. <laughs> booming at all-star dodge we're selling a ton of new vehicles with all the factory incentives and with just five hundred dollars down cash or trade we can put you in an 89 dodge omni for just 95 dollars a month an 89 shadow is just 134 dollars a month an 89 daytona is only 169 dollars a month all-star dodge we're just about everybody's credit is good all-star dodge baltimore's number one dodge retail dealer number one all-star dodge with locations in baltimore hagerstown prince frederick and denton in an age of artificial turf and super domes, there's still a place where the game is pure and rugged, and the beer has to be smooth and refreshing. <laughs> Introducing Guinness Gold, the golden lager beer that's as uncompromising as the people who drink it. Guinness Gold. Now there's a Guinness for everyone. We're here at Track Auto to find out why people come here for all their automotive needs. Sir, what brings you here to Track? Is this live? Well, how about selection? I mean, just look around you. And what about those low Track Auto prices? I mean, you know there's a seven-year, 70,000-mile auto parts warranty, huh? And how about the friendly and helpful employees? I mean, we've got caring, convenience, and price. Oh, my. If you need it, track got it. If Track doesn't sell it, you don't need it! They created a monster. Be sure to stay tuned to HTS for the scoring track game summary brought to you by Track Auto. It'll be coming up later in the game. No score as we go to the third inning. It'll be Gus Polliter, Paul Molitor, and Ed Romero for the Milwaukee Brewers. Your attention, please. For the Milwaukee Brewers, starting ninth, in short shot, number 14. Both teams have had scoring opportunities so far. Greg Brock walked leading off the second inning. They bunted him to second base. Then Malaki got Greg Vaughn on the ground out, struck out Mike Felder. And in the Orioles' second inning, with one out, Randy Milligan beat out an infield hit. Larry Sheets singled to put runners at first and second. But then Bob Melvin lined to right. Felder raced in, made the catch, and doubled off Sheets at first. Gus Pauliter leading off the third. He's batting 195. He takes a strike. Pauliter, who came up through the Angels organization, good fielder. He's from Venezuela. Strike two. When you see him, a little heads-up play by Felder in right field often is the kind of play that can just turn things around for a ball club. I mean, that Melvin bolt to right there looked like a sure base hit that was going to produce a run. Yet they got out of the inning with nothing. One ball and two strikes. Bob Malaki has been a real workhorse in his rookie year. His 172 and two-thirds innings are second among Major League rookies behind Texas Kevin Brown. Who would work two more innings beginning play tonight. 
Two balls, two strikes. In his first start with three days rest, Malaki threw a three-hit shutout against the Tigers in Detroit on August the 15th, winning that game two to nothing. Check swing liner foul of the seats back of the Brewer dugout. Rich Garcia, the umpire, is a, is a little guy anyway. So you might have to get the ball down even a little more than normally. Drive to the left center field. Here comes Stan Jefferson to make the one-handed drive. Joe Malaki takes care of the number nine hitter, Paul Mulder. They go to the top of the order for Paul Mulder. Molitor and Molitor <laughs> hitting back to back. Molitor and Molitor, Inc. Despite his injuries, Molitor will probably wind up playing somewhere around 150 games this year, which for him is very good. Mm -hmm. In fact, for anybody, it's pretty good. Played in 154 games last year. Called strike. Well, had some outstanding years. He hit 312 last season, 353 the year before to finish second behind Wade Boggs. Of course, he had the 39 game hitting streak that year. One ball, one strike. Well, they've got an offense very much again led by the likes of, of Yount Molitor. And it's around these two talented athletes that their offense spins. But you, well, what's new? You know, they've been battling twins for years. Big chopper off the plate. This is trouble for Hewlett. He battles the lights and can't get him. It was a tough play for a couple of reasons. First of all, Hewlett had to look up into the bank of lights. And then secondly, you've got a runner who gets down that line in good shape. To me, as soon as it bounced off the plate in that high, even though Molly probably looked at that ball a little too long, and that's, that's why I thought maybe he was going to get him. He's been having some hamstring problems, and I don't think he's mm -hmm. running as well as he does when he's healthy. Well, that call could have gone either way. You know, either ball club could have benefited from a call there, but the Milwaukee Brewers coming on top because they got the call. So Molitor reaches on the infield hit, the second Brewer hit. And the batter is Ed Romero, who grounded to third his first time up. Ball one to Romero, who first came up with Milwaukee in 1977. Didn't come back to the big leagues until 1980 and was with Milwaukee through the 85 season when he was traded to the Red Sox for Mark Clear. And the Red Sox released him earlier this year before he was picked up by the Braves. One of the better utility men uh, for a number of years. He can play all the middle infield positions and not a bad little hitter. But he was upset in Boston. Uh, he and Joe Morgan had their differences and on one occasion he got mad because they pinch hit for him and took a bucket of Gatorade and threw it out on the field and since then he's been known as Boston as Gator. <laughs> Fastball for a strike one and one. Well, now he was frustrated also because you know he obviously wore out his welcome but I think it was also predicated upon the fact that you know when Barrett went down. He wanted to make sure that you know he wanted to get some time in playing in the infield also because he'd been around a long time and he certainly had the qualifications. But he just wanted to play a little more often. A pitch out, but Molitor is not running. So when Barrett got hurt, they moved Jody Reed to second base. Luis Rivera played shortstop, and there was no room for Romero. Score top of the third inning. Yeah. 
Ground ball. Hewlett's been busy tonight. He can't go to second. He gets the sure out at first. Looked like he had a little trouble getting that ball out of his glove. And by the time he did, he had no play on Molitor. Well, you're right, Mel. He realized there's no sense in battling this and maybe throwing the ball to second and getting it there late. So, you know, when he regains control here in his glove and with his hand, he just records the sure out at first base. Now you've got an interesting proposition. How about this conversation? With the gloves in their mouth? <laughs> Looked like a meeting of the Secret Service. <laughs> you know, the TV cameras everywhere, so you know if you can read lips. That was classic. <laughs> spy versus spy. Uh -huh. BJ Suroff singled his first time up. So again, the Brewers have a runner at second base. They left a runner stranded at second in the second inning. <laughs> Ball one to B.J. Serhoff. It was the Brewers' number one pick in the draft in June of 1985. An All-American in North Carolina. He hit 392 in his career. Very versatile athlete who can play first, third, and of course do some catching. Ground ball to Randy Milligan. He makes the unassisted play as the Brewers again leave a runner in scoring position. No runs, one hit, and one left. We go to the bottom of the third in a scoreless game, and let's go to Tom. Well, Mel, the details on Ben McDonald's performance so far, Frederick, he's out of the game now after working three innings, giving up four hits, a run, no walks, and one strikeout. The game is tied at one. Frederick against the Winston-Salem Spirits. Ben McDonald pitching three innings, and hopefully we'll have some highlights of that before we end the game tonight here at Home Team Sports. We have a crew there covering that up in Frederick before that sellout crowd in Frederick. 1-1 between Frederick and Winston Salem. McDonald out of the game after three innings. One run, no walks, a strikeout, giving up a four hit. Let's take a look now at the Washington Post baseball scoreboard, bringing you right up to date on what's been happening in the majors this evening. The Tigers lead to Ronald 2 to nothing in the third. Or Lou Whitaker, two-run homer, his 26th this season. Detroit hoping to help out the Orioles tonight because if the Orioles can win in Toronto and Milwaukee both lose, the Orioles will build on their lead to three and three and a half games as they head into New York for the five-game series against the New York Yankees. And just a reminder, tomorrow night's coverage of home team sports orioles Yankee game begins at 7.30. Even if they're already in, the first game of the doubleheader will pick up that and then continue on with the second game. Boston and New York are scoreless in the fourth inning. Seattle leads Cleveland 2-1 to one in the third. Jeffrey Leonard with a run scoring fly ball. The other games in the American League a little bit later on. Oakland against Texas, 8-30. California and Kansas City also an 8-30 start. White Sox and Minnesota, they're scoreless in the first. In the National, two afternoon games. The Cubs lost their sixth in a row, losing to the Reds 8-5. to five. Joe Oliver, four hits and three RBIs. Mitch Williams with a couple of wild pitches that led to two runs. The Giants stopped the Mets 5 to nothing as... Matt Williams came through with a home run and two RBIs. The Mets stay a game and a half back in the National League East, failing to gain ground once again. David Cohn with his first loss in 15 starts. Dodgers and Montreal scoreless in the fourth inning. Expos could gain ground tonight. St. Louis could also pull it within two with a victory over Atlanta. They're scoreless in the second. Pittsburgh leading Houston 4-1 to in the second inning. A Jim Clancy error allowed two runs to score. And San Diego won Philadelphia nothing that in the second inning. Special happy birthday wish to Nichelle Robinson, Frank's daughter, 24 years old today, more beautiful than ever. And I thank her for the birthday cake, celebrating the birthday cake, or the birthday upstairs in the booth. Mel and John. Indeed. Nichelle and uh, her lovely mom, Barbara Robinson, watching the game tonight. Dad's got the Orioles in first place and all's rights with the world. That's right. Barbara got some ink in today's newspaper. Mm -hmm. Nice story on her. The real estate magnet. Mm hmm. Rene Gonzalez leading off the bottom of the third against Tom Filer. Gonzo playing second base tonight in the absence of Bill Ripken, who is placed on the disabled list. See, to me, Ripken, Billy Ripken is the spirit of this ball club out there at that position, but defensively, 
I think uh, Gonzalez is, is very much competent to play that position as he can play any of those infield positions. And he'll give you a good at bat too. He has an outstanding attitude. One of the hardest workers on the team. In an off-season uh, conditioning program in Australia when he was visiting a friend. Uh, he's continued to lift weights throughout the season. Works very hard, takes extra ground balls, keeps himself ready in the event he's needed. And it's got to be a little frustrating when you don't play every day, but you never hear him grumble. Stephen Mill, as he gets stronger, there's going to be much more interest in Gonzalez. You know, as he matures, he's still a young man. He's going to get stronger. He's going to be able to hit the ball with more authority. You know, the ball clubs are going to become very much interested in him. Slow bouncer up the third baseline. Surhoff's throw is perfect. It showed a little of that athleticism on that play. That was a nimble around the back, making yep. the play and a strong throw. It's a terrific play. This is a tester here for a third sacker. Anyone, especially someone who's not accustomed to playing that position as often as Surhoff is. You know, primarily a catcher moving down to third base. Of course, he can make a throw across the infield, but you know this this requires a lot of athletic ability here. Brings up Tim Hewlett for the first time. He takes a pitch low and away. Hewlett, who has just recalled from Rochester, the Orioles brought him here just in case uh, Bill Rifkin was going to be placed on the disabled list. The decision was not made until right before game time. Hewlett had appeared in 122 games with Rochester and was leading the International League in doubles and triples and hitting 280. Called strike, two and one. Hewlett is 29, spent several years with the White Sox, signed by the Orioles, a free agent. Three balls and one strike. I think Charlie O'Brien asked for an appeal to the first base umpire more than any catcher I've seen. He's constantly asking, even on borderline swings. Hit hard, knocked down by Pavater, but he'll have no play. Run his first at bat as a member of the Orioles. Tim Hewlett gets a base hit. You know, as I mentioned, now he swings the bat good. He always has, as long as I've known him playing in the big leagues. He would have taken a remarkable effort on the part of Polidor here to, to radar down this ball, then come up with it and throw a, a Hewlett out at first base. He did a nice job just knocking it down. Hewlett is aboard with a fourth Oriole hit. Bill Bradley singled his first time up and was thrown out trying to steal. Hewlett with only average speed at first base. Ball one to Bradley. Bill now hitting a cool 625 against the Brewers. That's up to date. Chopper to third. Surhoff goes to second. And the throw to first is in time. Well, the Brewers turn the double play to end the inning. And at the end of three, the Orioles and Milwaukee Brewers are still scoreless. Over its life, a motorcraft battery delivers enough energy to light up a small park. Like Candlestick Park. Shouldn't you install that peace of mind? Motorcraft quality parts from Ford. Motorcraft tested tough batteries have the cranking power you need for 40, 50, or 60 months. And now through August 31st, get up to $10 cash back on Motorcraft tested tough batteries from your participating Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury dealer. Check your local newspaper for details. <laughs> Put together your club, a group of pals, even your entire company. Have dinner at the park, raise money for your club, and get two free tickets for yourself. Call 1-800-BASEBALL. These are exciting times. You've got to be there. 
Heineken. Amstel Light. This so is much it. better than other light beers. Beer. A I delicious mean, European beer. Heineken and Amstel Light, America's number one selling imported and imported light beers. In my opinion, me, Amstel Heineken Light is the, the best beer there is. I could drink Bonnie Coleman, Washington Redskins. Hitting low. I would like the cup to hit right about here. George and Company, tailored for big and tall. Baseball fans over 30, stop dreaming. Now you can live your dream to play big league ball with Paul Blair, Al Bunbury, Pat Dobson, Merv Redmond, Brooks Robinson, and Earl Weaver at Orioles Dream Week this fall. You play for one full week in Florida in your very own Orioles uniform. And for more information, call 1-800-888-4376. That's 1-800-888-4376. The Earl of Baltimore is going to be there, huh? And again, congratulations to our winner in the Kodak 711 sweepstakes, C.F. Weisner of Pasadena. Went a trip for four to Chicago to see the Orioles and the White Sox. Ball one to Robin Yon, leading off the fourth inning. And this is beginning to shape up, John, as a typical Bob Malacki outing, one in which he pitches well, and the Orioles are unable to capitalize on scoring opportunities. They've had four hits so far, but haven't cashed in. Well, the opportunity they could have cashed in on, you know, Mike Felder played the, the defensive gem of the night in right field. So, you know, you have to give him credit for that. And, and that's why this is still a 0-0 game. 2-0 to Robin Young. Called strike. Okay. Talking with Tony Muser about what makes Young such a great player. And he said it's his attitude. He's the same guy every day. Whether he's hitting the ball well or whether he's in a slump, he never gets too high and he never gets too low. And he's a fierce competitor. He loves competition. That's well hit to deep center field. Jefferson is racing back with room. But you liken Yacht to a guy like Cal Ripken. You can just write his name in the lineup and count on him every day. You don't have to worry about him. Craig, Brock. Well, it's easy if you're a star because you know you're gonna you're gonna rebound statistically. But if you you know if you're a mediocre ball player, average player, you've got a right to get upset because you're not often gonna rebound statistically. Greg Brock walked his first time up. Twice so far, the Brewers have had men in scoring position, but have not been able to push across a run. Sliced foul out of play. But I've, I've noticed an exterior calmness on most major league ball players in the last decade. Maybe it has to do with the escalation in salaries. Which is good. Ooh. Got under it and hits it a mile high. And it'll be out of play. That one nearly brought rain. Don't mention rain, please. No, we don't need to hear that after a two hour and five minute rain delay last night. Greg Brock had an outstanding first year with the Brewers in 1987 when he hit 299 and drove in 85 runs. Last year he was bothered by a pulled ribcage muscle and missed a month and a half. But he's been healthy again this year and is playing well. One ball, two strikes. He was the man who succeeded Steve Garvey as the Dodgers' first baseman in 1983. Talk about a tough act to follow. Great year with the Albuquerque Dukes, the uh, Dodgers AAA Farm Club in 1982 when he hit 44 homers and drove in 138 runs. Tom Treblehorn is talking hitting. Change up is high. Two and two. And apparently, uh, based on that one great season of minor leagues, the Dodgers felt he was going to be a guy who'd hit 35 to 45 home runs in the big leagues. And yeah. he pushed himself a little too hard and pressed trying to hit home runs and developed a an uppercut type swing. And he hammers this one to right field. Orsalak is back and it is off the wall. Orsalak fires to second base and Brock just gets in there. 
No, that ball hit off the yellow. Here comes Treblehorn. He's going to argue it was a home run. Yeah, if hit off the yellow right there, it's a home run, with my understanding anyway. And now Mike Riley is going to confer with a second base umpire, Rocky Rowe. See, Andy Etcheburn flew out there too, and then Treblehorn comes out. So now Riley is going to make the umpiring rounds here to find out what exactly happened. So this ball hit right and looked like right in the middle of that yellow marker below the 360. And if, you know, if that's the case, I, I believe that's a home run. All right, now you got a real well, now we got a real good shot at it right here. Now we can really tell what's going on. With the flight of that ball come down, hit below the 360, and I believe it's a homer. Look like it hit right in the middle of the yellow. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a home run. And that's why they painted it yellow. Because from that point on, the fence, the wall is actually behind the fence. Right, exactly. And out of play. Anything hit to the right of the yellow would be in play, but to the left should be a home run or in the yellow. And he, uh, Tom Treblehorn, is seething. Now, you see, this is not the best school's English here. Now, of course, you're in the middle of a baseball diamond, and a play went against you, you've got a right to get upset. Now here's where the, the benefit of a TV replay would have helped the umpire because you could just never be certain in a game like this what the run what the what the spread is going to be. You know, it might be a one run game maybe a two run game maybe tied into the ninth. And Orsalak did just what he should go ahead and play it. You bet. So it'll stand as a double. Well, that's a big break right there. Felder makes a great play in right to prevent the Orioles from scoring, and here the wall takes a one takes one away from the Brewers. That's the third Milwaukee hit, and it brings up Charlie O'Brien, who laid down a sacrifice bunt his first time up. Ball into right center field. Stan Jefferson gets a good jump and makes the catch. And Brock tags and will hold at second base. It has not been a good series for Tom Troublehorn as Brewers came in here a half game out. He lost two starters with injuries last night. Jerry Royce, who started game one of the series, had to leave the game with a hamstring pull. And now he loses what appeared to be a home run. Greg Vaughn grounded to third, his first time up against Bob Malacki. Oh, when a manager, Mel, spends a lot of time scouring doctors and trainers' reports, he knows he's not likely to get the most mileage out of his team, but you know, he expects a ball that's hit over the wall to at least be a home run. accomplished with his ball club with so many entries is, is truly remarkable. Ball one. Trying to see if Malaki can secure this inning by getting Vaughn out, then he would have capitalized on a non-call by the umpiring group. And that obviously is not going to make trouble hard too happy. Seize the opportunities that are presented to you during the course of the game, and there's one here. Two balls and no strikes to Vaughn. Power hitting rookie, and Malaki is behind in the count to him. He's a good fastball hitter. Like most young hitters, still a little impatient and occasionally chase a pitch out of the strike zones and uh, can be fooled. The pitcher's change feeds on him. But he can hit a fastball a long way, and he's got to be looking fastball here with a count 2 and 0. Oh. Right. There it nice was. Ball away. But just right out of his zone. Now, if a good hitter like Robinson was, and he looks fastball out over the plate, maybe a little in. 
and on Frank stood right on top of the plate something that really a lot of players don't do in today's game. Vaughn's power is from right center field to left field. There's a lot of balls in the alleys. Malaki misses away and goes three and one. Well, you got to know who to walk sometimes during the game. Maybe Malaki feels as though maybe this is the right man to put on. He's got first base open with Tiny Felder up next. Felder does not hit many home runs, but Vaughn can. Slow bouncer up the first baseline. Malaki makes the pickup and tags Vaughn. So again, the Brewers leave a runner in scoring position, and Tom Trebelhorn is shaking his head. He knows he should have had a home run. Still no scorers. We go to the bottom of the fourth, and let's go to Tom. All right, now again, for uh, those who tune in a little bit late, Billy Ripken placed on the 15-day disabled list, injuring his shoulder yesterday, and Tim Hill has been recalled. A lot of the fans don't really know that down here, which really surprises me. Again, I don't understand why the fans are not more informed here at the ballpark. They pay a lot of hard-earned money, and they're kept in the dark about things like that. Billy Ripken placed on the disabled list, 15-day disabled list, right before the game started. Tim Hill was recalled from uh, Rochester. In case you're wondering about Ben McDonald once again, he uh, worked three innings before hit baseball, giving up a run, striking out one, and did not walk a batter. The game was tied at one when he was taken out. Detroit and Toronto, the highlight package with the Tigers now leading Toronto 2-1. to one. They're in the third inning. We're going back to the top of the first. Ken Williams at bat. Kenny jumps on a first pitch from John Cerruti. It's a base hit to left field, but George Bell misplays the ball, sort of lackadaisically. This is going to be an error charge to Bell, and Kenny Williams is going to wind up at third. Two batters later, Sweet Lou connects. Lou Whitaker hits his 26th home run over the right field wall for a two-run shot, giving the Tigers a two-to-nothing lead. Toronto's just scored a run, though, in the uh, third inning. So it's Detroit two, Toronto one. They're now in the third inning. The Blue Jays began play tonight. Two games off the pace, second place in the American League East. And, of course, the Brewers uh, trailing by two and a half in third place after the, uh, the loss last night to the Orioles. Let's go back upstairs now to Mel Proctor and John Bowingstein. All right, Tom, Tom Filer and Bob Malacki hooking up in a scoreless battle so far as we go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Stan Jefferson, Kyle Ripken, and Joe Orsalak, the two, three, four hitters coming up to face Filer. Was allowed no runs on four hits. He's walked none, struck out two. Center fielder, Stan Jefferson, Jefferson struck out his first time up. DJ Surhoff moving up a couple of steps to the edge of the grass at third. We've seen Jefferson try to bump for a base hit frequently. Out he takes a fastball low. One ball, one strike. Jefferson can either drop the butt third base side or take it with him in a drag bunt attempt. His power is what has uh, really been surprising. Four home runs since joining the club, and three of them have come left-handed. Yeah, that's one reason, Mel, why I would prefer not to see him bunt left-handed. I mean, he can fake a bunt and then draw people in and then swing. Grounded to Greg Brock at first, and he'll make the unassisted play. But, you know, this is rapidly becoming the kind of game where one run could be the difference. Now. So any way to get on would be beneficial. John Filer has pitched well since being recalled from Denver. They beat the Red Sox 5-2 in his last outing. And he was 5-1 with Denver with an ERA of 2.80 before being recalled. And finished strong winning his last three decisions with his efforts. Zephyrs. That, that sounds good. I think they're named after a train. There used to be a train that went to Denver and Rio Grande Railroad that operated in Denver, and they had a, I think the thing was called the Denver Zephyr. It was a train. Well, Amtrak, I believe, has a Zephyr that might even go through there. 2-0 to the cap. Well, you were talking about Father Teddy Higuera and, and Basio, Chris Basio, we saw pitch last night, could be hard-pressed to carry this club to the pennant without the likes of 
of a now healthy, as you mentioned, and respondent Tom Filer, who has, has really filled in nicely after a rash of medical ailments to press the hopes of this Brewers team. Two balls, two strikes to Cal Ripken. And as you alluded to, Mel, it's, it's been tough for, for Treble Horn to find the healthy, competent bodies to, to withstand the stresses of a long season. That's why Filer coming along at this time is coming along just the right time. Get into shallow right field. Mike Felder coming on. Two down. The Brewers and the Red Sox have both been decimated by injuries. Milwaukee now has 10 players on the disabled no. list, including pitchers Mike Birkbeck, Brian Clutterbuck, Paul Mirabella, Juan Nieves, and Bill Wegman. And of those, only Mirabella is expected to return this year. Jim Gantner tore up his knee. He's out for the year. Gary Sheffield is on the DL. Dale Swain won't come back until next year. Rob Deere should come off the disabled list this weekend in Toronto. He could give them a, a lift. Big power hitting outfielder. He uh, may not be able to play the outfield for a while. He was going to run tonight, test his ailing knee. Mm -hmm. So he may DH when he comes off the disabled list. Chopper to the shortstop, Pollitter. And he throws out Joe Orsalak as the Orioles go quickly in the fourth inning. The end of four, the Orioles, the Brewers are scoreless, and this is the Home Team Sports Cable Network. Football leads the way into September when Home Team Sports brings you 22 college games featuring the Maryland Turfs, Virginia Tech, Syracuse, West Virginia, and Navy. We cover the Redskins from preseason through postseason with Redskins Report, Redskins Magazine, and Dexter Manley, Redskins Review. I'll tell nothing but the truth, so help me. The Capitals are back in action from the Soviet Union when home team sports presents exclusive coverage of the NHL Soviet Series to get you primed for the regular season. Ridley walking in, centers and a shot, and a goal! And the Orioles come at you 16 times in September when the comeback kids play Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, and Milwaukee. The ball skips away from Kroner, here comes the runner, the throw to the plate, and he is safe! Hit it into center field. Devereaux coming on to make a great catch. All this and more in September and exclusively on Home Team Sports. Oh, is this kid putting on a show tonight? What's new? Blue is a window in the front. Coming down the avenue. Your new blue valve pack envelope. With big values for you. What's new? You can't lose on the road if you have a cellular one car phone because with cellular one you can touch base at any time. So keep in touch from your car and get ahead of the competition. Call cellular one at 220 2000 in Washington or 1 800 cell one in Baltimore. Mel Proctor with John Lowenstein back at Memorial Stadium with the Orioles going for a sweep after winning the first two games against Milwaukee. Five to nothing and four to two. They're getting good pitching again tonight from Bob Malaki. He's allowed only three hits, but Tom Filer of the Brewers has matched him so far. Tiny Felder leads off the fifth. That's a fair ball down the left field line. And Felder will go into second with a leadoff double. So the Brewers have had a runner at second base in each of the last four innings and still have not scored. That's right. Well, they, you know, they've rallied around some recent fine pitching and some timely bat work. And this could be very timely right here, the way that the pitching is going against them and for them. And they've had some defense of their own to get back into this divisional race. Now, what they need tonight is a run here. The only thing you got to worry about in Milwaukee now is whether or not they're likely to be short of able-bodied personnel. Especially if the healthy ones keep falling by the wayside. But right now, with no outs, you think Pollard here down at the bottom of the order would have to bunt him to third base to give Molitor a chance to drive him in. Molitor fly to center his first time up. Hewlett at third, Milligan at first. They're playing in. Felder, a very fast runner at second base, and Gonzalez and Cal Ripken are trying to pinch him and keep him close. Well, the idea is to get the corners up tight. You might get him at third with a poor bunt. 
he could just try to steal third. He has 21 stolen bases in 24 attempts. A great percentage. I think that's why the dogging at second base. They don't want him to steal third base and then give three guys a chance to drive him in. Strike call. So right now the defensive posture is that Hewlett is kind of laying back at third base. And then Milligan is coming in hard and Malaki is coming in hard. So what Pollarder has to do right now, as long as Ripken at short is not going to cover third base, come out over and cover, is bunt the ball hard down to Hewlett. There's a lot of holes in that infield the way the defense is set up right now. Mm -hmm. Big hole on the left side. Swing it away. It's lined to Milligan who drops it. He tosses to Malaki covering. See now Randy's been guilty of that on more occasions than once where he tries to make the play before he catches the ball. Even though he's been a superb fielder at first base, he's dropped a lot of balls, and this is one where, you know, he takes his high off at just a second in anticipation of throwing the second for the double play, but he's got to get that first one initially. He was already starting to look towards second base, thinking that he might double up Felder. Yep. Now the situation is a lot different. That was a big out. Instead of getting the run over a third with one out, he's still at second base. But Paul Walters struck out and reached out an infield hit. You hit on it now. There were a lot of holes out there with the way the defense was jockeying about, and Mulliger had the misfortune of hitting right at somebody at first base. Now you've got to be wary of the steal. That's hit high in the air to deep right field. Back goes Joe Orsalak as Felder tags at second. And he'll advance to third in the fly ball. You know, now this is precisely what I was describing. Had they gotten the man to third base, more than likely a very competent batsman like Molitor would have been able to get that uh, run home. So that's two and potential runs the Brewers have lost tonight. One on the ball that Brock hit off the right field wall that should have been a home run. And then Polliter hitting a line drive to first, and Felder was unable to get over to third. He now moves up on the fly ball, but there are two outs. Ed Romero has grounded out twice. Malaki will work from the stretch. Felder bluffing down the line at third. That'll get the job done as Romero comes through with a single to score Felder, and the Brewers take the lead. You know, they were in minus two in, in, in runs they should have had, and then Mahler, and then uh, Romero gets one of them back, so now they're only minus one. It comes over today from another team, and he gets a big hit to put the new team ahead here in a ball game. I've always liked the way he swings the bat, and he's going to get his share of hits. But they're finally able to play the run they should have had earlier. One run, five hits for Milwaukee. No runs and four hits for the Orioles. B.J. Surhoff has singled and grounded to first. Ball one. for a strike and it's one and one. Surhoff comes from quite an athletic family. His father briefly played at the New York Knicks and his older brother Rick has been a professional pitcher in the Phillies and Indians organization. High fly ball to right which is playable for Joe Orsalak. The Brewers take the lead on a leadoff double by Felder, and two batters later, Romero singled him home. And it's one to nothing, Milwaukee, as we go to the bottom of the fifth, and let's again go to Tom. Well, this is the um, moment devoted to Brooks Robinson each night where we say hello to the people that uh, stop by here at the ballpark. I want to say happy birthday to Sean Sklowowi from her grandpa. She's nine years old. And also hello to Jeff and Arlene Brownstein. They're down in Richmond, used to be in Baltimore, from Lisa and Mike. That takes care of the uh, well wishes tonight. Again, Ben McDonald worked up three innings of four-hit baseball, gave up a run, struck out one. Hopefully, we'll have some highlights. They turned a triple play in the second inning behind Ben McDonald up there in Frederick before a sellout crowd. The game was tied at one when he left against Winston Salem. Let's take a look now at the uh, Washington Post baseball scoreboard and begin with the Tigers leading the Toronto Blue Jays 4-1 to one in the fourth. 
since we last spoke. Chet Lemon has come through with a two-run double earlier. Lou Whitaker, a two-run homer, his 26. Tigers lead 4-1 over Toronto in the fourth inning. Boston now blanking the Yankees, 1-0 in the fifth. Luis Rivera with a RBI single. The Orioles will be heading to New York after tonight's game. Play the Yankees five games, including a twilight doubleheader. It starts at 4.30 tomorrow. The coverage on home team sports begins at 7.30 tomorrow night. If they're still playing that first game, you'll see the last portion of that and then on to the second game. Seattle 2, Cleveland 1. That's the game now in the fifth inning. Jeffrey Leonard with a run-scoring fly ball. Oakland leads the West by 2 over California. They're scoreless with Texas in the first. California trying to pick up some ground. Has a 1-0 advantage over the Royals. The Royals are hot right now. They've won eight games in a row. That game's in the first inning. And Minnesota 3, Chicago nothing in the second. In the National League couple of finals, Cincinnati beating Chicago 8-5. to oh, Cubs have now lost six straight games. Mitch Williams with a couple of wild pitches to set up uh, a couple of runs. Joe Oliver with four hits and three RBIs. The Giants flank the Mets 5 to nothing as Matt Williams hit a home run, drove in two. David Cohn took his first loss in 15 starts. Mets still a game and a half back in the National League East. Dodgers and Montreal scoreless in the seventh. If Montreal can win, it'll only be a game back. Atlanta leads St. Louis 1 to nothing in the fifth. It's Pittsburgh 5, Houston 1. They're now in the third inning. And San Diego 3, Philadelphia nothing in the fourth. That's a complete look at the Washington Post scoreboard. Back upstairs now to Mel Proctor and John Lowenstein. All right, thank you, Tom. Bottom of the fifth inning with Milwaukee leading one to nothing as the Brewers try to salvage a win in this series. And the first pitch to Randy Milligan is the ball. He had an infield in his first time up. The Orioles have had a runner on base in every inning but one so far and haven't scored. A couple of double plays bailed the Brewers out in the second and again in the third innings. And the fourth, Tom Feitler set the Orioles down in order. He's retired the last four batters he's faced. A drive into right center field. Felder is racing back and can't get it. Milligan is on his way to second. And he's in with a stand-up double. Well, you watch the flight of this ball. Can't track Felder's reaction in right, but it didn't look like he ran off to the ball quickly initially, and that's what kept him behind here. You don't know if there's something wrong with his legs or not, but he really got off to a real slow start in right field. And this ball was just about midway between the outfielders, but it was bending back toward Felder, but he just got a very late jump on the ball. Well, Milligan leads off the fifth with a double. He's two for two tonight. The batter is Larry Sheets. Ball one to Larry. You can see Filer work him away. Larry's got to try to pull the ball on the right side and get that runner over to third. Not the situation where you'd expect him to bunt because he almost never bunts. Very good, Coach. He doesn't have a sacrifice this year. Filer wants him to hit the ball the other way if he's going to put the bat on the ball. One ball, one strike. Larry looped the base, hit it in the center field in the second, and then got jammed and hit the ball off his hands. One to nothing, Milwaukee. Two balls in one strike. You, you can't make a better pitch than that. You know, it was just off the plate. And he was hoping that the batter would be swinging. And he hit the glove. That's right where O'Brien wanted him to throw the ball. Uh, Charlie is, is very active behind the plate, which means he, he engages the umpire in constant conversation, it looks like. You, know, you as a catcher, you want those kinds of pitches. him away again and goes three and one. He's got first base open. Well, we'll find out how much Tom Filer wants to pitch to Larry Sheets here. If he can get him out on something away, right. it'd be okay, but he doesn't want to get him anything inside that he can pull. Pretty good pitch to hit, but it's lifted foul. And it'll reach the seats. Like Filer made a mistake on that pitch. That was right down the middle. Now he didn't pay the price for that pitch. 
And now, now he, he, he doesn't really have to throw a fastball right there again. You know, he can throw a slider down in the end or maybe a changeup. I think on that pitch, he either wanted to go back outside and missed, or he wanted to come way in, and the ball drifted out over the plate. Yeah, yeah Charlie was setting up on the outside part. You know, not down, not dead center. But you can't always throw it where you want to. Now he sets up outside. And a ground ball foul up the first baseline. The Orioles will leave right after the game via charter for New York, where they'll play a doubleheader tomorrow night. A single game Friday, Saturday, and again on Sunday. They're off on Monday and then go to Cleveland to begin a three-game series. There goes Milligan, and Sheets lines it foul. And Randy had third base stolen. Well, you can understand Filer ignoring Milligan to some extent at second base because, you know, this is what pitching is all about. The one-to-one -one confrontation between you on the mound and a hitter at the plate where some reasonable expectation can be had for the Orioles and to some extent scoring a run. Line drive caught by the first baseman Brock, but Milligan gets back at second. There you go. It, it all depends upon when the ball was hit. Had it been hit on a line to Brock last time, they'd have had a double play. And, you know, Larry does what he wants to do here, pulls the ball. And he continues to sting the ball well. Mm -hmm. Bob Melvin came up with runners at first and second in the second inning, had a sinking liner to right. Mike Felder raced in, caught the ball off his shoe tops, and threw to first to double up Sheets to end the inning. Tying run at second base with one out. Strike one. professional pitcher and it's tough for a batter to hit off of someone like this. He spent a lot of time in the minor leagues. You know, he obviously knows all about the game of pitching. So, you know, these kinds of circumstances are not new to him. One half of the shortstop Pollitter over the first for the second off. So the Orioles had a runner at second base and nobody out. Now there are two gone. Megan's Gonzalez up for the second time. He grounded the third his first time up. Surhoff across the first. The Brewers get out of the inning as the Orioles leave the tying run at second. No runs, one hit, and one man left at the end of five. Milwaukee has a one to nothing lead. When it's time to put an ad in the Yellow Pages, why do most advertisers use the CNP Telephone Yellow Pages? Because the book to be in is the book most people look in. The genuine CNP Telephone Yellow Pages. The book that's been matching more people to more services for over a hundred years. No wonder it's called The Matchmaker. To bring more business to your business, be in the right book. Make a perfect match. The genuine CNP Telephone Yellow Pages. No other book can match it. A Bell Atlantic Company. Don't need Paris, don't need Rome. I'm having more fun sitting right here at home. I'm just a scratching, matching, trying my luck. 
never had so much fun for a buck. Oh, what fun! <laughs> what fun! Instant fun! The Maryland Instant Lottery. Only your Maryland lottery agent has the $5,000 money match game. If you're searching for great oldies on the radio, the search ends here. Extra 104, now with 10 great oldies in a row. Well, she was just 17. Extra 104 is the only Washington radio station that gives you great oldies all the time. Great oldies from the 60s, back to back, nonstop. So, for your favorite oldies anytime, remember, set a button on your radio to 104.1 FM. Extra 104, great oldies all the time. Puma and Capitol Plaza are hosting a slam dunk contest, and prizes include Puma t-shirts, Puma new stealth basketball shoes, bullets tickets, and much more. You can also register to win a 1990 Ford Mustang. Join Phil Chenier, Kevin James of WKYS, Liddell Eccles, and Harvey Grant of the Bullets for fun at Capitol Plaza, Saturday, August 26th. Robin Yacht, Greg Brock, and Charlie O'Brien for the Brewers in the sixth inning. Milwaukee leading one to nothing. Mike Felder doubled to open the fifth inning. And then three batters later, Ed Romero singled him home, and that's the only run of the game so far. And it's shaping up as a typical hard luck outing for Bob Malacki. Robin Yacht is fouled to first and fly to center. Ball one to Rock and Robin. Bob Malacki has worked. Eight or more innings, ten times, but is four and two with four no decisions. That's a tip off of the kind of luck he's had. Two and zero oh to Young. You know, everyone that's marched out there for the Orioles, uh, generally speaking, over the last three nights has done the job against both Molitor and Robin Young, and you can't ask for more than that to keep his club in check. Bouncer up the middle, Renee Gonzalez backhands it. Off balance throw is in time. An outstanding play. Yacht runs very well, but Gonzalez was able to get him. You know, again, I reiterate, you know, defensively, they might not be missing a thing, not be skipping a beat by having Gonzalez at that position at second base. Even as accomplished as Billy Ripken is, because Gonzalez can make all those plays too. And you know, this is the real tester right here. Going across your body, coming across the second base bag and behind it. Greg Brock has walked and doubled, and he fouls the first pitch back. One ball and one strike to Brock, who was acquired from the Dodgers for Tim Leary and Tim Cruz. Talked about how he, the Dodgers thought he was going to be a prolific power hitter, but uh, it never really panned out that way. He hit 21 home runs one year, and as a rookie, hit 20. And as Tony Muse would like to point out, hey, Bo Jackson hit 20 his first year, so. Those were decent numbers for him early in his career, but he never developed into that big home run threat. And uh, he's changed a little bit as a hitter since coming to the American League. He hits the ball the opposite way more frequently. Takes a strike. Tony said he got him to flatten his bat out, take a more level swing, lowered his hands a little bit, made some mechanical changes. And he's been satisfied with the results. Ooh, that hit Bob Melvin. They've got him on the helmet. Yeah, if you're going to catch, then you're going to hit. Going to hit by the ball. You know, that's quite apparent. It's going to happen. On the knee, it right like. off the top of the left knee, and that can sting for a little while. It makes you wobbly legged. The first base is, is is primarily an offensive position, and the Brewers need Greg Brock to produce the runs. He skies it high in the air to shallow left center. Phil Bradley racing in and taking charge. Two outs. You, 
even as well as Tom Filer is pitching, you know, you begin to feel a little uneasy as you march into the end of the late innings of a game with only a one-run lead. For Bob Malaki, it must seem like a bad dream. He's seen this too often. Frequently, when he pitches well, the Orioles don't seem to score any runs for him. Charlie O'Brien is 0 for 1. He fly to center and has also laid down a sacrifice bunt. Strike one. Malaki has won seven and lost ten, but he has pitched as well as any pitcher on the staff overall. The record could actually be the reverse of what it is without any problem whatsoever. See, I, I, I think I think Malachi Mel is the equivalent of the stopper on this ball club. You, know, you, get, you get those kinds of efforts from it. I mentioned that he's worked eight or more innings ten times, and in those starts, the Orioles have averaged only 2.4 runs per start. And they've scored only uh, haven't scored at all tonight. Drive to right field. Orsulak backpedals, and he's got it for the third out. Oh, Malaki is pitching well again tonight, but right now he trails. It's one to nothing. Milwaukee, let's go back to Tom. Well, Mel, a gentleman came up to me a few moments ago here in the stands and uh, told me that they're trying to put together a package on these shirts from DNA Marketing in Hanover, Maryland. They're on sale down at the sports shop down at Harbor Place on Pratt Street. And really what it's basically saying is Baltimore is the O zone for the Orioles, which is kind of a clever little phrase. But I really... Uh, I'm a little hesitant on that ozone. I've never liked that term O's in regards to the Orioles personally. I've always thought it's the Orioles and the birds because I always thought the O's didn't really uh, kind of the connotation there was zero. And uh, I think this ball club for years was always known as the Orioles and the birds. And then suddenly a lot of out of towners came into this town and started nicknaming them the bird. I mean the O's. And I've really never liked that personally, but uh, at least it's something kind of controversial here for the stretch run. We're going to take a look now at some of the Detroit-Toronto highlights and begin in the top of the fifth inning. The Tigers have runners at second and third, and Chet Lemon comes up with a two-to-one lead favor of Detroit, and he lifts a drive to right. A junior Felix looks like he's going to catch this ball. It hits his glove, drops out for an error. Both runners score, and the Tigers take a four-to-one lead. Earlier, Lou Whitaker had hit a two-run homer, so Detroit leads it four-to-one right now. Toronto obviously would like to gain a victory tonight to stay as close as the Orioles as they possibly can, or in fact, try to gain ground on the Orioles. But the Tigers helping the birds cause tonight a little bit by leading Toronto 4-1 to one with the game now in the fourth inning. After look at the highlight package, we'll be back with six outs with an update on the entire Washington Post scoreboard. Let's go back upstairs now to Mel Proctor and John Lowen. All right, Tom. Tom Filer has given the Brewers five strong innings tonight. He's allowed no runs on five hits, no walks, and has struck out two. If Tommy gives him this kind of pitching from here on out, Mel, I'm firmly convinced that we're going to see this this 89 campaign unfold for good in the final week of the season. You know, it's unlikely from what I've been witness to, from what we've been witness to, that either of the top three clubs in the East will unravel before then. Brian Holton is beginning to throw in the Oriole bullpen. Third baseman. Cam During the uh, usage of this four-man rotation, pitchers working on three days rest for the Orioles, the starters have been surprisingly strong. Jeff Ballard went the distance in pitching a shutout. Dave Johnson went nine last night. 0-1 to Tim Hewlett, who singled his first time up in his first at bat as an Oriole. One ball, one strike. Hewlett has had some decent years in the big leagues with the White Sox in 1985. He hit 268, and the next year in 86, he hit 17 home runs. So he's got a little pop. Two and one. Bill Ripken was placed on the 15-day disabled list tonight with a strained shoulder. Craig Worthington also injured his shoulder last night, so Hewlett is starting at third, Rene Gonzalez at second base. If you're a good utility man, you can stay around this game for a long time. A guy like Ed Romero is an example of that. I believe that if you're a, if you're a good part-time player, 
you're not making a lot of money, you can play the game a long time. Popped up. Greg Brock digging hard, and he's got room. One out. Well, some early hits and runs were really all the birds needed Not last night. Win. When an opposing team Bradley. has their horse on the mound like uh, the, the Brewers did last night with Chris Bossio, it's preferable to score as many as possible quickly in any moment of weakness. But we've not seen uh, many moments of weakness from Tom Filer on the mound. Bossio gave up four runs in the first two innings, but nothing after that. And wound up losing four to two. Bill Bradley singled in the first and brought it into a double play in the third inning. Strike one. And you mentioned uh, Dave Johnson. I think that story is just an absolutely amazing development in the career of a of a persistent young lad, never willing to toss in the final towel, much like Tom Filer right here. Neither overbearing nor overpowering. He just he just knows how to win. Slow bouncer to third. And it's a foul ball. And Johnson has been a catalyst for this Orioles staff. And you know, that could be what, what the Brewers are going to see too here from Tom Filer. Filer's case is a little different than Dave Johnson's, though. He had one outstanding year with Toronto when he went 7-0. Mm -hmm. Johnson really had nothing more than a cup of coffee one year. I think five relief appearances with the Pirates. Yep. His only previous taste of big league action. But he's been incredible. Three complete games mm -hmm. and five starts, and three in his last four. Named American League Player of the Week. Must feel like Cinderella waiting for midnight to strike. <laughs> so far, the slipper fits. Well, the, the clock has come to a halt. One ball, two strikes to Phil Bradley. We're in the bottom of the six with the Brewers leading one to nothing. <laughs> Struck him out. Filer's third strikeout in his first since the first inning. Well, you're really seeing witness tonight how good pitching can bring any kind of offense to a screeching halt. Jefferson. And he's done it with that fastball, a little slider that nicks the outside part of the plate and just a you know just a seemingly very occasional changeup. Stan Jefferson over two. He struck out and grounded to first. Something that you've talked about on so many occasions, Mello's location. The name of the game of pitching. Out of the second, and Romero makes the play, and the Orioles go quietly in the sixth inning. It's still one to nothing, Milwaukee, and this is the home team sports cable network. <laughs> Kelly is running a pitch out. Melvin throw to second. Right here on Home Team Sports. on the freshest values in town. It's always sunshine fresh in the produce department at Giant. It's now time for the scoring track brought to you by Truck Auto, and there hadn't been much of it tonight. Ed Romero's single scored Mike Felder in the top of the fifth inning to give the Brewers a lead, and that has been it. Tom Filer is working on a shutout through six. It's one to nothing Milwaukee. Bob Malacki has pitched well, but this is nothing new for him. 
He has worked Vaughn. at least into the seventh inning 17 times this year, but has won only six of those games. With well, the Orioles averaging only 3.3 runs per game. Greg Vaughn leads off the seventh. Vaughn has grounded out twice. And Malachi knows with Tom Filer pitching so well, he can ill afford to give up another run. Vaughn looked like he wanted to bunt. One ball, one strike. Well, anything to make something happen here. You know, both pitchers have only given up five hits. So they, they both both teams have been short of base runners. Breaking ball that hangs upstairs, and it's two and one to Vaughn, who was named American Association Player of the Month for both June and July with Denver. He set a Denver record with nine RBIs in one game against Stratton. He hit for the cycle in that game. Three and one. Four year old outfielder from Sacramento, California. It was the Brewers' fourth pick in the secondary phase of the June 1986 draft. He was called up when Rob Deere was placed on the disabled list. Well hit to deep right field. Back goes Orsalak to the warning track, and he's got it. Hoping that that Vaughn can replace the instant offense that that Rob Deere has provoked this season. You know when you hit 20 to 30 home runs a year and that man goes down, then you miss the, you miss the instant credibility that Rob Deere can bring to the plate. They'll have to make a move when Deere comes off mm -hmm. the disabled list this weekend. Somebody's going to have to go to make room for him. Mike Felder has struck out, doubled, and scored the game's only run. Ball one to Felder acted like he wanted to bunt. The Brewers have good overall team speed. With Molitor and Suroff and Yap, Vaughn, Felder, they can all run. Two and no. Oh. One run, five hits, no errors for Milwaukee. No runs, five hits, no errors for the Orioles. John, we want to say hello to Rich Justice, who normally covers the team, or does cover the team for the Washington Post. He has a night off. He's watching the game at home tonight at home team sports. So gave him a night off. Rich and Marty. Hmm. Here comes Stan Jefferson, but Cal Ripken calls him off. Well, you saw Richard's uh, spiked haircut uh, the last few days, and it looks good on him. It's, uh, let's see, it's about two years removed from style, though. Well, it looks good on him. I think you'd look good with a spike. There. I might go to that. You're still sporting the Wyatt Earp look. Yeah. That's for the off-season uh, adventures. The man who led two lines. <laughs> Gus Pollitter, the batter, with two outs, nobody out in the seventh. He's fly to center, crowded to first. What, what, what does a reporter do when he covers baseball all season long? Does he go home and watch the game on TV? Yes. That's why we said hello to him. There's a dedicated man. On the corner for a strike, and it's one and one. One strike to Pollitter. Mike Riley says no swing on the appeal. Outfield straight away and not too deep on Pollitter. Doesn't have much power. He has not hit a home run this year. A drive to center field. Back goes Jefferson. Stanley's got it for the third out. Well, they're up for the seventh inning stretch here at Memorial Stadium, but the Orioles are trailing. It's one to nothing, Milwaukee. And let's go back to Tom for a look at the scoreboard. First, the uh, Ben McDonald stats once again. A lot of people are very interested in what Ben McDonald did tonight, especially here in the stands. He uh, worked three innings, 45 pitches, gave up four base hits and a run. 
did not walk a hitter, struck out one, and had a triple play turn behind him during the second inning when he left the high score, Frederick for one, Winston-Salem one. That was after three innings of play. And maybe we'll have some highlights before the evening is over here on Home Team Sports with the McDonald performance in Frederick. Let's update you now on the Washington Post scoreboard. Right now, Detroit and Toronto are tied at four in the fifth inning as Fred McGriff and Junior Felix have hit home runs to bring the Blue Jays back from a 4-1 deficit earlier. Lou Whitaker hit a two-run home run. Jet Lemon drove in two, or actually played in two because of an error in the outfield by Felix. But Felix sort of amended that with a home run, and so did Fred McGriff. 4-4, Toronto and Detroit. They're now in the fifth inning. Nick Kostaski and Dewey Evans have homered. Boston leads uh, the Yankees 4-0 in the seventh. Earlier, Luis Rivera had an RBI single. Seattle and Cleveland are tied at two in the sixth inning. Jeffrey Leonard, a run-scoring fly ball. Texas 2, Oakland nothing. That game now in the third inning. The California Angels are now trailing Kansas City as the Royals bid for their ninth win in a row. It's 2-1 KC in the second inning. And Minnesota 5, Chicago nothing. They're now in the fourth. In the National League, the Cincinnati Reds 8, Cubs 5. The Cubs have lost six games in a row, but their lead remains at a game and a half. Joe Oliver, four hits and three RBIs. The Giants stopped the Mets 5 nothing. so the Mets failed to gain any ground. Matt Williams uh, with a home run and two RBIs for the running San Francisco Giants. Dodgers and Montreal are scoreless in the eighth inning. If the Expos can win, they can pull it within a game of first place. Cardinals are trailing Atlanta, 3-0 in the sixth. If, it, if the uh, St. Louis Cardinals can win, they would be only two games back. They're trailing by two and a half right now. Pirates six, Houston one in the fifth, and San Diego five, Philadelphia two. That game now in the fifth inning. That's a complete look at the Washington Post scoreboard. Let's go back upstairs down to Mel Proctor and John Lowenstein. All right, Tom, well, it's getting late. We're in the seventh inning, and the Orioles have still not scored a run. The Brewers get up. Tony Fossus and Chuck Krem in the bullpen. They are used as a setup man to get to Dan Plesak. And as we get closer and closer to the eighth and ninth innings, it becomes Plesak's turf. And he can really be tough. But right now, the stage belongs to Tom Filer, who's scattered five hits and leads one to nothing. Now, I'm not sure anyone coming out of the bullpen right now could parallel the effort we've seen from Tom Filer. He's retired six in a row. He's giving up a double to Randy Milligan in the fifth. Side with a fastball, but it's ball one to Cal Ripken, who has struck out and fly to right. Glenn Braggs is now in left field for the Brewers. What a better defensive player than is Greg Vaughn as they try to protect the one run lead. So Braggs will hit the number seven spot in the order for Milwaukee. Bragg, Schott, and Felder in the outfield. Surhoff, Pollitter, Romero, and Brock around the infield with O'Brien behind the plate. And Filer going strong on the mound. Slider for a strike, and it's one and one. He's really been basically a two-pitch pitcher tonight. A fastball, which he spotted, moved around well, and that little slider, and once in a while, an off-speed pitch. But his control has been pinpoint. Breaking ball has popped up off third base. Surhoff on the move. One out. That's seven in a row. Retired by Filer, who seems to be getting stronger. Tony Fossus is the left-hander. Chuck Krim, the right-hander. Select tonight has grounded a short twice. Ground ball up the middle and it's in the right field for a base hit as Romero just missed it. Well, the tying run is aboard with one out. Well, unless you get somebody on, you usually can't score. You know, unless you hit the ball over the fence, you got to get somebody on to score some runs. I mean, he just missed coming up with that ball right there to make the play. So the only thing that makes a manager uneasy in that other dugout is the fact that if somebody unloads here, then you're behind by a run. Randy Milligan is two for two. He hits a drive into right center field for a base hit. Orsalak is streaking for third. And he'll be held at third base as Milligan goes into second with a double. See, Melly hit the ball too hard. 
if you don't hit the ball so hard, then Felder can't get to the ball so quickly because he makes the play here. Off the wall, he's got the ball in his hand, makes a good toss to the cutoff man, and Cal Ripken Sr. says, whoa, Tiger, you got to stop at third base. Oh, uh, he didn't say that. Look at here. Oh, well, I don't know. But he made the play right there. Felder made it. He's been a he's been a corn on the Orioles' foot. Let's see if they bring in the left-hander Foster's to face Larry Seats. Finer has pitched well, but he's been tagged for a couple of hits, and Tom Treblehorn is on his way to the mound. Well, you, you, there's just no way you can diplomatically explain to Tom Filer well, why you have to take him out of the game here. And he might not take him out of the game. He's thrown exceptionally well. He's still got good velocity on his ball. His slider's moving for him. Milligan just, just took a pitch on the outside part of the plate that time and just drove it up the gap. But until then, he's very much in charge of this game. A fly ball here would tie the score. Orsalak with better than average speed at third base, and Sheets is up there trying to hit the ball in the air. What you should try to do is just try to hit the ball, hit the ball over the fence, and hit the ball with a lot of authority. They're going to put him on. They're walking intensely. So they won't even take a chance with him. And Bob Melvin will be coming up with the bases loaded. You know what this really does, Mel, is that this even puts a little more stress on the pitcher on the mound because now he can't pitch as finely as he did before because you can't afford to walk anybody. Now you might be able to uh, give a hitter, you know, a much better pitch to hit that ordinarily he might not have expected. But you know, this is just an option a manager has to make, and of course he talks to Filer first to see what he wants to do. Might have talked about the possibility of pitching around him, trying to get him to swing at something out of the strike zone, or just going ahead and walking him, which they did. Bases are loaded. Now we're going to get pinch hitter Jim Traber will bat, and this could be a spot where he'll bring in Foster's to face Traber. Yeah, see, I, I was just thinking, I was thinking that Troublehorn was going to going to make Robinson make the move to promote him to take Filer out of the game. But still, who knows what Troublehorn's going to do? You know, right now he's quickly, quickly assessing what his priorities should be at this moment. And that's going to be it for Filer. As Tom Treblehorn makes his move to the bullpen for Southpaw Tony Fossus. But regardless, Mel, right now you're bringing somebody in who did not have a vested interest in this game up to this point. So Filer will leave with a one to nothing lead. The base is loaded. And with a new pitcher coming in, let's pause for this message from Precision Tune. I don't ask for much, do I? Little gas, little oil, an occasional tune-up. I mean, look at me. My plugs don't have that old spark. I'm hard to start. I hiss, I hiss, I hesitate. I hate that. Well, I've got the answer. Precision Tune. They'll diagnose my problem, tune me up, and guarantee it. So take me to preci preci Precision Tune. Whew. We better get going. Free engine diagnosis through September 30th. Call Ads 1001 for your nearest location. Heineken, Amstel Light. This so is much it. better than other light beers. beers. A I mean, delicious European beer. Heineken and Amstel Light, America's number one selling imported and imported light beers. In my opinion, me, Amstel Heineken Light is the, the best beer there is. I could drink. Monday nights at 6.30, tune in to Home Team Sports for the Washington Post Sports Talk, a weekly program featuring Washington Post sports columnists and guests, plus interviews with fans on the street about the hot topics in sports. Every Monday night at 6.30, it's the Washington Post Sports Talk. Ode to Track Auto, a poem by Dwayne F. Schneider. <clears throat> S is for selection, everything from A to Z. C is for convenience, with many stores to serve your auto needs. E is for Track's fine employees, helpful with advice. L is for Track's long-term warranty. Gee, that's nice. P is for those low Track Auto prices. Put them all together, they spell Scout. If you need it, Track's got it. Scout. It's a word. Track Auto. Tell you cheer for home team sports. 
Jim Traver was announced as a pinch hitter for Bob Melvin, and then Tom Treblehorn, the Brewers manager, brought in southpaw Tony Fossus, and now Frank Robinson counters by setting up the right-handed hitting Keith Moreland with the bases loaded. Well, you see, manager Tom Treblehorn is doing what he thinks is necessary right here to get out of this hitting without allowing even one single run. And then, of course, manager Frank Robinson brings in Moreland, a professional hitter whom they required who they acquired for these kinds of instances right here to try to produce a run or two. One to nothing Milwaukee. The bases are loaded with one on and Moreland coming up. Keith has not hit well since joining the Orioles, but he seems to be coming out of his slump. In the last three games, he's gone four for 13. For the Orioles, coming from Jim Traver. Number six, Keith. Moss's job primarily is to come in and get left-handers out, but he also has a good sinker and gets a lot of ground balls, and he's also pretty effective against right-handed hitters. So but see, he's deaf to left-handers. Yeah, well, this comes with the territory. You know, you, you put a good hitter in, but he doesn't run very well. And you got a guy with a good sinker, he hits it into the ground. Not only could they turn two, but if there were no outs, they could turn three. Keith Moreland is grounded into 16 double plays this year. Ball one. But it can be a grievous situation to pitch into with the bases loaded and only one out. A lot of pressure on Fossus to throw strikes. Good stop by O'Brien as Fossus almost wild pitch the tying run home. But it's 2-0 to Keith Moreland. Joe Orsalak is at third. Randy Milligan at second. And Larry Sheets at first. One to nothing Milwaukee. You see right there, Mel, he hasn't been able to throw that ball about at the knees there and let it sink a couple of inches. He started it out too low. 30-year-old left-hander from Cuba, Tony Fossus, who throws a sinking fastball and what he calls a slurve. Matter of fact, Moreland might even feel confident in taking a pitch. He's a much better hitter in this situation with a count in his favor. And he drives it down the left field line, and Dee Bragg's racing over it. He can't get it. It's a fair ball. Orsalak will score. Milligan is right behind him. Here comes Sheets heading for the plate, and he'll score. Well, Moreland comes through with a double, and it's a ground rule double because the ball bounced out of play, so that's going to cost the Orioles a run. Sheets had crossed the plate, but they're going to make him go back to third. But the Orioles take the lead, getting two runs, and the base is loaded double by Keith Moreland. Yep, that's exactly what happened, Mel. And if Moreland only produces one victory over the final two months since they've acquired him, the price of that investment is entirely worth it. Watch the ball here. Just carry him up in there. Cross the line. And now Moreland gets a tremendous ovation as he comes off the field. So Orsalak and Milligan score on the pinch double by Keith Moreland. His biggest hit is an Oriole so far. The fans are poised for a sweep. The two runs are charged to Tom Filer. Who cannot win now despite pitching brilliantly. And Tony Fossus was unable to do the job and he'll leave the game. So with a new pitcher coming in, let's pause for this message from Precision Tune. I don't ask for much, do I? Little gas, little oil, an occasional tune-up. I mean, look at me. My plugs don't have that old spark. I'm hard to start. I hes I hes I hesitate. I hate that. Well, I've got the answer. Precision Tune. They'll diagnose my problem, tune me up, and guarantee it. So take me to preci preci Precision Tune. Whew. We better get going. Free engine diagnosis through September 30th. Call ads 1001 for your nearest location. 
Over its life, a motorcraft battery delivers enough energy to light up a small park, like Candlestick Park. Shouldn't you install that peace of mind? Motorcraft quality parts from Ford. Motorcraft tested tough batteries have the cranking power you need for 40, 50, or 60 months. And now, through August 31st, get up to $10 cash back on Motorcraft tested tough batteries from your participating Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury dealer. Check your local newspaper for details. The all-new 1990 Subaru Legacy has more impressive standard features than the Camry or Accord. Now, to make room for the Legacy, Subaru is clearing out its 89s. With $1,000 back on 89 sedans, $1,000 back on 89 three-doors, $1,000 back on wagons, $3,000 back on XT, $1,000 back on Justy. With all that cash back standard, you can raise your standard of living. Raise your standard of living. See your Subaru dealer. This summer, some amazing things will come from out of the blue. The blue Valpak envelope. During the Valpak Out of the Blue Instant Winner Game, you'll be able to win prizes instantly. Like free week-long cruises aboard the SS Costa Riviera, round-trip tickets for two aboard American Airlines, and lots of other great prizes. Look for details and valuable coupons in the blue Valpak envelope. And get packing. Valpak, we're America's favorite mail. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium where the fans have bought their brooms. They're ready for a sweep. The Orioles having won the first two games and have taken the lead on a bases loaded pinch hit double by Keith Moreland. Chuck Krim is the new pitcher for the Brewers. Jamie Quirk is running at second base for Moreland. Krim leads the league in appearances. This is the 60th game he's worked in this year. Well, he throws good with a good spinner. He's got good velocity on his fastball, too, but really, he's in the same predicament. Jamie Quirk who will pinch run and stay in the game to catch. One out, runners at second and third. The Brewers bring the infield in at the corners. Ball one to Gonzalez. Krim throws the basic four pitches. Sinking fastball, curve slider and changeup. Good control, and he's really been pitching well. Very durable. In fact, Chuck yeah. Hardenstein says he could pitch almost every day. The Orioles will sometimes squeeze with the Gonzalez at the plate. He takes the strike. They've done it a couple of times this year. I'd like to see him continue to let this inning unfold. You know, they've recaptured the lead. And, and maybe just a kind of a flare here over a drawn up infield could produce two more runs. We certainly have seen that uh, that case of event that you described. That's that particular scenario at least a couple of times this year. Well, they hit a slow runs. runner at third base and Larry Sheets. Way outside. Two and one. With one out, Joe Orsalak got it started with a single. Randy Milligan doubled his third hit of the game. Sheets was walked intentionally. And then Keith Moreland delivered with a pinch hit ground rule double to drive in two runs and give the Orioles the lead. Ball strike and it's two and two. See, regardless of who's hitting, Krim has the luxury of an open base. So he puts that good spinning ball that he has up there in hopes of getting a strike on it. Dan Plesak is beginning to throw in the Milwaukee bullpen. He will normally come in when the Brewers have the lead. Ground ball in the left field for a base hit. Sheets will score. And Quirk goes to third. It's three to one. of over 32,000 is delirious. Too many chances of something going wrong if you maybe try to squeeze in that situation. You can't rely on the pitcher to make the kind of pitches necessary, but with a drawn-up infield, a hitter like Gonzalez becomes a 350 hitter. And then he, uh, he's allowed to produce the third Orioles run right here. All three runs were charged to starter Tom Filer, who pitched well. 
until this inning. It's unfortunate because Fodder pitched brilliantly up to this inning, and those who didn't really have a vested interest in the game up until the point Fodder left, you know, have, have provided the margin for the Orioles. Jamie Quirk is at third. Gonzalez at first, one up. Tim Hewlett is up, and he takes the strike. Hewlett singled his first time up and has also popped the first. The Orioles trying to sweep the Brewers for the first time since June of 1985 when they took four from Milwaukee here. Hit foul out of play and it's 0-2. Three runs, nine hits, no errors for the Orioles. One run, five hits, and no errors for the Brewers. Strike three, call. Looked like he was looking for something off speed. He threw him a fastball right down the middle. Two down, that'll bring up Phil Bradley, the eighth hitter to come up in this inning. Phil is one for three tonight. He singled, grounded into a double play, and struck out. Three to one, Orioles. Bottom of the seventh. Way inside, ball one. Chuck Krem, who played collegiately at the University of Hawaii, one of three former University of Hawaii Rainbows on this team. Glenn Braggs and Joey Meyer also played for the Rainbows. So they lead the league in Rainbows, if nothing else. <laughs> Quirk at third base. Rene Gonzalez being held at first by Greg Brock and Greg Olson watching from the bullpen. They have needed him lately with all this rash of complete games. High fly ball to straightaway center field. Back goes Robin Yap. The inning. As the Orioles rally as they get three runs on four hits, two men left on base. At the end of seven, they now lead the Brewers three to one. The all new 1990 Subaru Legacy has more impressive standard features than the Camry or Accord. Now, to make room for the Legacy, Subaru is clearing out its 89. With $1,000 back on 89 sedans, $1,000 back on 89 three-doors, $1,000 back on wagons, $3,000 back on XT, $1,000 back on Justy. With all that cash back standard, you can raise your standard of living. Raise your standard of living. See your Subaru dealer. You really do need an understanding of all sides of an issue. Listening to people exchange their ideas and opinions can be compelling. The discussion is often spirited, even emotional, but I always try to be fair. It's interesting information. If you really want to stay on top of what's going on in the world, you have to listen. Every great city has one great radio station. Listen to Radio 11, WBAL. Today, there's a gasoline that offers what no other gasoline ever has before. It's new System 3 gasoline from Texaco. With continued use, it can keep new cars running like new and actually help restore performance to older cars. System 3 gives you more power from every octane. You could be an instant winner with the Out of the Blue sweepstakes featured in the Blue Valpack envelope arriving in your mailbox soon. 
The Orioles rallying from a one to nothing deficit to take a three to one lead as they try to sweep the Milwaukee Brewers. Jamie Quirk, who entered the game as a pinch runner, stays in to do the catching. Well, the Orioles have given Bob Malaki the lead, and he seems to be getting stronger as the game moves into the late innings. Since giving up a single in the fifth inning that drove in the Brewers' only run, he's retired the last seven batters he's faced. Well, this four-man rotation is right. really agreeing with these young pitchers, Jim. Exactly. Even though even though uh, Frank Robinson has gone to the four-man rotation out of desperation, in my opinion, I bet he didn't think it would produce the That's kind of results we've seen. Paul. Uh, it appears the lads Ballard. are entertained by the moves. I should say, Ballard with a shutout two nights ago, Dave Johnson with a complete game victory last night. And in five games pitched with the four-man rotation, they've gone four and one with two shutouts and two complete games, three complete games. Paul Molitor leading off the eighth inning. He had an infield hit in the third, has also struck out and fly to right. Ball one, you can see him slide his hands up the bat. He will bunt for a base hit. He's a good bunter. He falls behind 2 and 0. Oh. Call strike 2 and 1 to Paul Molitor. To me, Mel, what might have been overlooked last inning was the fact that the job that Krim did on Hewlett at the plate, he got him looking in a, in a first and third situation with less than two outs. Now, if Milwaukee gets a man on base, they could be in a position where they could tie the game up with a homer. And Malaki goes three and one to Paul Molitor. If Molitor gets on, that would bring the tying run to the plate. We have activity at both bullpens. Hit foul out of play, and it's three and two. Kevin Hickey and Mark Williams that are throwing in the Oriole bullpen. Dan Plesak was up in Milwaukee's bullpen. Looks like he stopped throwing. They've got a right-hander up now. Struck him out. the heater blaze it right by him you have to challenge him you can't walk and you've got to make him earn the right to first base or beyond Jamie Navarro is up in the Brewer bullpen and Dan Plesak has resumed throwing that's the third strikeout for Bob Malaki as he punches out Molitor and here's Ed Romero who drove in the only Brewer run with a single in the fifth inning that scored Mike Felder who had let off with a double Hit foul out of play. Well, that's eight in a row retired by Bob Malaki, the big bird. I would, I would think as much adversity as he's seen during the course of the year and not having much, many runs scored for him in, in many instances that he would have gotten his second win seeing that three spot go up in the bottom of the seventh. That's out of play and it's 0-2 to Romero. Romero asking Rich Garcia about the location of the pitch, and you can tell by his reaction, he said it would have been a ball. Uh, a hitter invariably knows where those pitches are. He just wants some reconfirmation from an umpire who really couldn't care less whether that ball was over the plate or way outside or up. Now he's got to protect the plate with two strikes. Two as Romero lays off the pitch. Orioles three, Brewers one. Top of the eighth inning. Romero will be followed by B.J. Suroff. 
grounded foul off third base. Romero is a contact hitter who normally puts the ball in play. He doesn't have much power. for a base hit and he also almost took Malaki's head off. So Romero is two for four and that'll bring the tying run to the plate. And in addition to that it looked like he almost caught it. No he sees it he's got time. And, oh it just grazes off the glove and, and just misses his hat at the same time. He wasn't completely squared up on his follow through he might have had that ball he had his body twisted to one side. Hickey and William Center throwing in the bullpen as Frank Robinson heads to the mound. Frank has seen this situation all too many times with Williamson and Hickey obviously ready in the bullpen. Frank has taken him some out, taken him out in some sticky situations. Sometimes it's worked out, sometimes it hasn't. This time he's going to stay with it. Now for the most part, it hasn't. And I'll bet you that's entered into Frank's decision right here. Well, Tom Trevelhorn took Filer out of the game. That didn't work out as Fossus gave up that big pinch hit double to Keith Moreland. And now Frank will let Malaki face the left hand hitter, B.J. Suroff, who is single in three plate appearances. Ed Romero at first, one out, three to one Orioles. He's had some real good cuts off of Malaki. Strike one. You know, had he just kind of lowered his sights a bit on some of those swings, he would have had one or two home runs tonight. He's got good loft on the ball. He just hasn't gotten the distance this evening. He hasn't hit many home runs. He's hit four this year, five last season, and seven the year before. Could be two. Cal Ripken charges, feeds Gonzalez, and that's all they'll get. Sirhoff runs very well and beats any play they might have had at first. But they get the lead runner for the second out. Yeah, that's the key right there, Bill. You called it. Yeah. Getting that number one runner there to second base. It, you know, getting the for sure one out. Besides the way Romero was coming down to second, the important thing was Gonzalez catching the ball and getting out of the way. But he got him and he tempted him on a pitch on the outside part of the plate, maybe off it. Malaki is still not out of the woods as Robin Yount steps in with a runner at first and two down. Yount has only one hit in the series. He's one for ten. Strike one. Well, I'll say it, he, he's, he's way overdue. He's got power. A tall, wiry guy, six feet, 180 pounds, but very strong in the forearm and wrist. He's hit 14 home runs this season. He hit 29 in his MVP year in 1982. And Malaki backs him off the plate. One ball, one strike. Because of the shoulder injuries, he's probably uh, not able to pull the ball as much as he did earlier in his career, according to Tony Muser, but he's compensated. He hits the ball more to the other way, but he's got power to the opposite field. He skies one high in the air to left center, but it's playable for Stan Jefferson. So it's on to the bottom of the eighth inning with the Orioles leading Milwaukee three to one. of artificial turf and super domes, there's still a place where the game is pure and rugged and the beer has to be smooth and refreshing. <laughs> Introducing Guinness Gold, the golden lager beer that's as uncompromising as the people who drink it. Guinness Gold. Now there's a Guinness for everyone. Over its life, a Motorcraft battery delivers enough energy to light up a small park, like Candlestick Park. Shouldn't you install that peace of mind? 
Motorcraft quality parts from Ford. Motorcraft tested tough batteries have the cranking power you need for 40, 50, or 60 months. And now through August 31st, get up to $10 cash back on Motorcraft tested tough batteries from your participating Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury dealer. Check your local newspaper for details. Put together your club, a group of pals, even your entire company. Have dinner at the park, raise money for your club, and get two free tickets for yourself. Call 1-800-BASEBALL. These are exciting times. You've got to be there. Be sure to tune in every Monday as the experts discuss the hottest issues in sports on the Washington Post Sports Talk at 6.30 here on the channel you cheer for, Home Team Sports. Well, normally Dan Fleesack comes in when the Brewers are ahead, but he hasn't worked in three or four days, and his last outing was a long one, John, four and a third innings. Yeah, he pitched Saturday in, the, in that game of the week and did go four and a third innings in that ball game. So it, it's a curious situation. Obviously, just bringing him into the game to kind of to hold things where they are, if that be the case, and he getting his little work in, but you know, obviously they didn't want him to pitch in that seventh inning when the Orioles scored even though that would have been more preferable with the with the Brewers holding on to a one run edge at the time. Fleesack is having another outstanding year. He's won three lost three He's tied for the league lead in saves with 28. But if you know you're going to bring him in to pitch at least one inning what is an extra one and a third when he's had three days rest. So you know hindsight is always 20 20 but that's why managers you know have these gray hairs all the time because they're paid to make these quickly snap decisions like that and often it's easy to analyze but difficult to decide upon in that dugout. Stan Jefferson will lead off the bottom of the eighth inning. He's 0 for 3 tonight. He tries to bunt, pops it up. But Surhoff was unable to get there in time. See, now there's no surprise here. Ball clubs know that that he likes to fake a bunt and even likes to bunt. So Sirhoff was was sneaking way in on the grass, and it, and it wouldn't have been uh, advisable for Jefferson to bunt the ball that time because he'd been thrown out easily. Lisak has great stuff: an overpowering fastball, an outstanding slider, and he'll throw a change once in a while, but he goes right after the hitters. Here that ball pop off in Charlie O'Brien's mitt. It's one ball, one strike. And the most difficult pitch of any to punt is, is that 90 plus heater. Popped up, shallow right field. Romero going out. Felder coming on, and Romero makes the catch and cradles it against his body. Ed Romero in his first game back with the Brewers, contributing with two hits, a run batted in, and now a fine running catch. And hitless in three plate appearances tonight. Facing the tough left hander, Dan Fleesack. Line to right, Felder in quickly to make the one handed grab. Well, there he is again. You know, he's been in the right field corner, he's been up behind the second baseman and first baseman in that area right there, that vicinity. He's been in the right center field alley as well. He's been all over the field. But he anticipates real well where balls are going to be hit. And he doesn't play very deep. Now we're going to pinch hitter Mike Devereaux will bat for Joe Orsalak. That will not only allow Frank Robinson to get a right-handed bat up there against a left-hander, but will also allow him to get a good outfielder in the game to protect the lead. Imagine Devereaux will go into center, and Jefferson will probably shift to right in the top of the ninth. Ball one to Mike Devereaux. Mike has hit safely in each of his last four games. It also puts a guy at the plate who, if he gets on, could steal. One ball, one strike. His stats are interesting. From the ninth inning on, 
He's hitting 387. <laughs> of course, he's hit those mm -hmm. two dramatic home runs to win games. That's right. He's a money player. Going to be around a long time, I think. Handcuffed. One and two. Gleesack with 30 saves last year, 23 the year before. 6'5", 210 pounder. He played college baseball at North Carolina State. High fly ball to left field. Drag circling toward the line. And that ends the inning. So we've completed eight. And the Orioles three outs away from sweeping the Milwaukee Brewers. It's three to one, Orioles. Remember when every song on the radio was your favorite? 105.7 WQSR-FM. The music that made you feel good then is making you feel good all over again. The Beatles! Oldies Radio, WQSR. The greatest hits of all time is now the biggest hit in Baltimore. Oldies Radio, 105.7 WQSR. If your kitchen has lost some of its original charm, let Sears replace your old, worn cabinet doors with new doors, adding beauty and value to your home. Dial this toll-free number now to arrange a free, no-obligation inspection of your kitchen cabinets and learn how a knowledgeable representative can help you select the style and rich tones perfect for your home. Call now to see how easy it is to have Sears install new cabinet doors and finishing on your old wood or metal cabinets. Sears, your money's worth and a whole lot more. All-Star Dodge has hundreds of trucks and lots of factory incentives that were just $500 down, cash or trade. You can drive an 89 Dodge Dakota for just $138 a month. An 89 full-size D100 pickup is just $167. 89 Caravan with air and automatic is only $269 a month. At All-Star Dodge, we beat credit union, fleet, and buying service prices. All-Star Dodge, Baltimore's number one Dodge retail dealer. Number one, All-Star Dodge with locations in Baltimore, Hagerstown, Prince Frederick, and Denton. Welcome back to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. A crowd of 32,702 on hand tonight. The Orioles are just three outs away from a sweep of the Milwaukee Brewers, leading three to one. And three top hitters coming up in the ninth. Greg Brock, Charlie O'Brien, and Glenn Braggs to face Bob Malecki. Ball one to Brock. Well, after getting only 10 complete games in their first 123 games, the Orioles are on the verge of getting three in the last three games. Mike Devereaux stays in the game in center field, and Stan Jefferson moves to right. Malaki falls behind, 2-0 on Brock. Brock has walked, doubled, flied to left. Greg Olson is throwing in the Oriole bullpen. putting Brock on and bring the tang around to the plate. Well, Rocky has walked only one batter tonight. He walked Brock in the second inning. Time called. The Orioles felt that Rich Garcia called time too late. That's the pitcher can injure himself on a play like that. There's momentum heading toward home plate and holding on to that ball. And he walks him. See Frank Robinson telling Randy Milligan to hold the runner. Second Go walk allowed by Malacky. He's going to. He's going to play behind him. Charlie O'Brien is 0 for 2 with a sacrifice bomb. After O'Brien will be Glenn Bragg. That looks like it's going to be it for Malacky. He may be running out of gas on a hot, humid night. Well, he's been out there for for eight plus a batter. 
and Olsen is the man you go to in this situation very similarly to the guy kind of way that that manager Tom Trebelhard would go to Plesak in a similar situation so the Kitty Corps is trying to nail it down one rookie Bob Malaki went eight innings plus a batter in the ninth and he gets a near standing ovation from this crowd of over 32,000 brilliant effort on the part of Malaki. Bob went eight innings plus one batter in the ninth. He allowed one run on six hits, walked two, struck out three, and leaves with a three-to-one lead. One thing this rash of complete games has done is prevent Greg Olson from getting any work. He hasn't pitched since August the 17th when he worked an inning in the third of scoreless relief and the Orioles 11 to 6 went over Toronto. To me now that's preferable. Uh, the only alternative is that when, when you've got a starter throwing exceptionally well, you let him pitch eight instead of nine, and then you bring your closer in every other day or so to keep him sharp at eight. Olsen has been kind of erratic anyway, regardless of the amount of work he's had. You know, he'll, he'll make the game interesting, but he'll also bury an opponent on that good fastball and that absolutely devastating breaking ball of his is effective. And the Brewers will send up a pinch hitter, Terry Francona, to bat for Charlie O'Brien. You know, this is interesting because they felt confident with O'Brien up there against Malaki, but they don't have that same confidence with uh, Olsen facing O'Brien. They'd rather have Francona up there. If they're going to hold the runner on, then you'd want a left-handed hitter up there. But it looks like Milligan might, might even play behind this runner with Francona up there swinging from the left side. But, hey, this... This right now, this part of the game, this is Greg Olson's. Greg has allowed only four runs in his last 38 and a third innings at home. His last six appearances have been scoreless. He went through that rough stretch during the Orioles road trip in which they dropped 12 to 14 games. He had three bad outings, but has bounced back. Coming in in a save situation, and he needs just two saves to become only the 11th Major League rookie all time to get 20 or more saves in a season. A guy like Francona coming up to the plate, you know, he's not likely to hit a home run. He doesn't have that kind of long ball ability, but he's a good contact hitter. Well, Terry Francona will pinch hit. Francona hitting 227, three homers, 20 runs batted in. Greg Brock at first base, nobody out. The Orioles lead three to one. Strike one to Frank Cohen. The son of former Cleveland Indian outfielder Tito Francona. Well, if he didn't realize it before, then then Francona real realizes it now that he's got to crank it up a bit. Olsen with a 90 mile an hour fastball and a devastating curveball, which is effective against left handers, it is against right handers. Ground ball to first. Milligan goes to second for one. That's all they'll get. So Brock is forced at second, but Francona reaches on a fielder's choice. See, this 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 looks like an easy play. You know, a little bouncer of the first baseman. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen this play become a become an erratic adventure because the first baseman hits that runner in the back with a ball. But he gets it cleverly here and cautiously to Ripken to record the out. That'll bring up a big power hitter in Glenn Braggs, who entered the game in the seventh inning. Braggs has the capability of tying the score with one swing. He went into play left field. This will be his first at bat. He has 13 home runs, but he strikes out a lot. He's fanned 90 times this year. Enormous potential, but he's never really lived up to it. Now, he's one of those, those guys that one year he's going to explode on the scene. Big swing, strike one. He was 0 for 2 in last night's game. 
Tony Musa was saying one of his problems is he's too tense at the plate. He's just squeezing that bat to death when he's up there. He's trying too hard. He said he's got to learn to relax a little bit. Relax his hands as he gets ready for the pitch to arrive at the plate. But he's got great tools. Big, strong kid. If he's tense to begin with, what does he feel like when his team is on the verge of being swept and there's one out in the ninth? And the Brewers fading fast in the American League East. Now that's pressure. Yeah, and now he's just gotten a quick glimpse of that breaking ball. And he's already seen that, that fastball push at 90. Another breaking ball right here. Just got a piece of it. See how hard he swings, even with two strikes. He's not shortening up. He's still swinging yeah. for the heels. I like that. I like that approach because then you give the, the the impression to the pitcher on the mound that you're all over that breaking ball when really he's he's hoping he doesn't throw it. The kid from Nebraska, Greg Olson, that with two strikes on Glenn Briggs. Greg grew up in Nebraska, played college baseball at Auburn. His father is a highly successful high school coach out in Nebraska. I'm sure his dad's watching tonight. He got here earlier this summer to see his son pitch. What a year he's had. Oh, yeah. Goodbye, Uncle Charlie. The hook master comes at him with that hook. That's the pitch he wanted to throw. Good form. That was a big hitter because Braggs was a guy capable of tying the score. Now brings up Felder, who's a decent hitter, but he's not the threat to hit the ball out of the park. And the Orioles are one out away from the sweep. at second base and the Orioles have swept the Milwaukee Brewers. The Brewers came to town having won nine out of ten and just a half game out but the Orioles drove them three times. Cal goes to Gonzalez for the force on Francona to end the game. And the Orioles sweep the Brewers for the first time since 1985. 
The total tonight for the Orioles, three runs, nine hits, no errors, and five left for Milwaukee. One run, six hits, no errors, and seven left. Bob Malachi, who pitched brilliantly, gets the win. He's now 8-11. and 11. Greg Olson picks up his 19th save, and Tom Tyler is the loser. He's now 4-2. So the Orioles take three from Milwaukee, 5 to nothing, 4-2, to two, and 3-1, to one, and get ready to head for New York. We'll be right back. Put together your club, a group of 